Hello again, friends! And you are our friends, and welcome back to another edition of Jim Cornette's drive Through right here at the end of February, the beginning of March, by the time you hear it, leap year. On the 29th of February, we sit here to record this mess. But what better way to pay tribute to Ole Anderson than to have an awful intro here to the show? I'm your host, the great Brian Last. Here's Mr. Jim Cornette. Morning, Brian. Now, that's Bob Roop. That's not Ole Anderson. <clears throat> oh, I'm so Hold on. Let me wake up here. I'm not well rested. We've been having problems down here in this in this region in the Ohio Valley area, and I'm not well rested for that. Generally, when we have one of these programs where I've had very little sleep, I'm either cranky or silly. Perhaps in honor of Oli today, I will go toward the happy horse shit and just not take anything seriously. But now, have you heard about our weather? Well, now you be you've been down. You've had a little flu bug. Over the past day or two yourself, fortunately, you were able to get a good meal in before you went down. But more on that, I'm sure, at another time. But nevertheless, have you heard about our weather? No, we've been having weather issues up here. We just had a massive windstorm last night, so I did not hear about your weather. Well, how fast was your wind blowing? 40 to 50 miles per hour. Well, we had that, and we did it first, instead of the Simpsons. You know what happened last February. You remember the, the, the two storms a week apart that we had in identical weather that we've been having. It'll get up to 70 degrees, and then a fucking low-pressure system will come in, and we'll have fucking severe weather, and then it'll be snowing and freezing. And last year, two weeks in a row, we had horrible storms, including that one where we had tornadoes in the area. Fucking heavy rain, 100 mile an hour straight line winds, fucking damage everywhere. My neighbor's fucking pine tree, 60 foot fucking dip, fell over on my fence, big chunk out of my maple, chaos everywhere. The neighbor had no power for a week. As you may recall from my updates on the program where she had the Home Depot rented generator with a fucking cord stuck through her kitchen window because her neighbor's tree took her power lines out all from the road to her house and in a wooded area where you couldn't even tell which tree was down. And it took the power company a week to come and dig that shit out and restring a line two or 300 feet or whatever. So I'm nervous about these things. So we, they said, well, we're going to have some thunderstorms Monday night, Tuesday morning. Nothing to worry about too much, but, you know, just regular old thunderstorms. At 4.30 in the morning, bam, crash, pow! Lights coming through. It looked like goddamn Independence Day with the fucking flying saucers landing with the lights coming through the window from the lightning. And Harley was not amused. And, of course, I get up and monitor these things, so I, I was up at 4.30 on Tuesday morning, but the, pr the storm they had been promoing... Tuesday night into Wednesday, massive low pressure system, thunderous fucking wind speed. Uh, tornadoes are likely in this situation. The, the weather service upgraded it from a slight risk to an enhanced risk. We were in the orange category, Brian. A big oval across the goddamn Midwest and Ohio Valley. You people are fucked. The, the announcers are basically saying, make out your last will and testaments. There were tornado warnings in Chicago, I think, right? Yes, it was all part of this massive storm system. And our uh, our weather guru here, Mark Weinberg, was saying, I'm more worried about severe weather in Chicago. It could be even worse. Which, as it turned out, it was. More on that in a minute. So I'm thinking, oh, fuck, and it's supposed to come through between 3 and 4 in the morning, Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. I'm thinking, I've got to, you know, keep an eye on this shit. That's what, it's exactly what happened last year. And then on the 6 to 7 o'clock news, they started backing up on it. They started, well, you know, Mark's saying, well, I, I don't agree with the, uh, the severe area going this far this way. And now the weather service is saying, well, it appears that some of these storms may not be materializing across the southern plains or whatever, but still we're going to have some shit going on. So be prepared to meet your maker. So I set the fucking alarm for three o'clock in the morning for me and little Harley stay sleeps through these things. Unless I come in screaming, go under the pool table now. 
And I get up, and it takes until 4 o'clock for the storm to come through my little section of the world here, my little part of the community. And it wasn't as loud or impressive lightning-wise or as much rain as for the one that they had fucking... Not that I'm complaining now. I'd rather that than death, destruction, and poof, you're gone. Uh, but it wasn't as loud and impressive as the one the previous night that they didn't issue all these warnings about. Now, some people down south got a little bit worse weather and a severe storm warning and hail the size of, I believe they said rutabagas. I'm not sure. But, but no, but so then when that's all gone through about 530, I said, well, maybe I could go to sleep, but I had to get up early because I had to run Harley over for a checkup. So I've had very little sleep and what I have done in my waking hours is watch a lot of questionable television wrestling. So I am now here, yours, ready to do whatever it is that you want to do here on your program. Did, did I remind everybody that the, the joyous occasion has come and come quickly? It, 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 sometimes it's good for things to come quickly, ladies and gentlemen. The first 250 packages or so of the action figure sets of the Heavenly Bodies and the Midnight Express that have been ordered from JimCornette.com, where they are available exclusively nowhere else in the world, have they have been shipped and are arriving in the hands of the greedy consumers, what paid for them. And I told you, Brian, about this assembly line process me and Featherbottoms got going on now from the other on sales we've done, the lessons we've learned. And I will also have you know that all of the pictures have been signed and personalized for all of the orders that you have made up until about two days ago, as I sit here and speak. And another 250 or so packages is going out this coming week, and another equal uh, or uh, almost equal portion are going out the following week, and we are going to be caught up, and if you can order now with impunity that you're going to be getting your figures within the next two to three weeks, well, void where, where you're outside the goddamn country. That takes longer, and you know that. So shame on you for expecting, uh, having unrealistic expectations. People want to order something in goddamn Bolivia. Think they'll get it on Thursday. Fuck you, it don't work that way. The world does not work that way. But JimCornette.com is working. And you can get all these action figure sets while they last. And remember, the heavenly bodies, because it's the first and only, have, uh, have outpaced the Midnight Express tag team figures, and they are rapidly dwindling. So if you want, the, if you want some heavenly bodies in your life, hurry up. JimCornette.com. Everything's signed. It's about to be sealed, and it will shortly be delivered. That's right. Get those figures today. Wonderful collectibles. Oh, and, oh. and the feather bottoms want me to, well, the feather bottoms wanted me to say that because we have, have been able to whip this thing into shape and they are packing now all of the other merchandise, the, the Cornette face t-shirts, cult Cornette membership certificates, books, DVDs, and et cetera, et cetera, will go back up for sale on Saturday, March 9th. We took that merchandise down to concentrate on the figure sets so that we didn't get further uh, backlogged or waterlogged as we have sometimes been. And now that stuff will be able to go back up on sale as we have slogged through this log. All right. Should I dare transition? Or you have more merch talk? You uh, get to? I got, well, let's see. We talked about the weather. We got the merchandise. Uh, they got to, 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 what's new with you? Hey, did you see Carrie Hare? I think it was Carrie Hare posted a picture on Twitter of his classic cornet mug with the logo on it. Yes, that's the one of the ones that we. Well, that, that's a pint glass, is what he. That's had. a pint glass. That's right. Yes, that's right. not a mug. Not what, a what's mug. the matter with you, you mug? I used the wrong Boy, word. They would make fun of you over across the pond, in the United Kingdom over there, not knowing a pint glass from a mug. They they would belittle you for that. That's that's a big deal over there. They these people take their drinking seriously over there. Well, the last time they belittled us, look what happened. We got a country, so I would well, be careful they, about that. They, they may have another shot at it here pretty soon. You never know. Well, you never know, but Jim, why don't we start? We have a lot of topics, a lot of big topics to get to and a couple of big reviews that you, uh, things you watched over the last few days, but let's start with a serious topic. Ole Anderson, Rock Rogowski passed away this past week. 
a storied career, a legendary career, lots of stories, lots of incidents, wrestler, booker, promoter, everything. Someone you had lots of dealings with. You saw him as a fan. You were a colleague of his. Eventually, somehow you earned some respect from him, I think. <laughs> but someone who at various points in your life you certainly thought different things about. Let's talk a little bit about Ole Anderson. Um, and it, also, it, for the people, Rock Rogowski, he wasn't the Rock, but for the people especially who had known him since the Ganya days, it would call it Rock, and everybody knew it personally, you know, not on TV, but in the locker room or whatever, and everybody knew who you were talking about. Um, well, although I will say, when he turned babyface, like that match with Big Bubba in the cage at the Crockett Cup, that was his name. They called him Ole Anderson the Rock, and he had a shirt that said the Rock on it. Well, that's that's right. And then all of a sudden, Vince McMahon made Don Morocco the Rock. So they took that away well, from him. <laughs> well, but I, th I think maybe they may have taken it away because uh, uh, it was too close to the Rock and Roll Express at that time. No, it, in all seriousness. Um, well, Ole was 81, and unfortunately, he'd been in bad health for some time now. I get, did he have multiple sclerosis? Oh, I can't say it. I MS? Believe, yeah, multiple sclerosis, I believe. Yeah. Thank you. Um. And, you know, and that, it's a shame, but at 81, and my God, he survived, even stabbed seven times, including that one in Greenville. It was like a fucking half inch from his heart. Uh, and, you know, just a, a long and varied life. And Ole's not the kind of guy, I mean, I'm not saying with his, you know, family and, you know, we're close friends, but Ole's not the kind of guy that you really cry about because I don't, he would have laughed at you if you did, right? Because that sarcastic old rat. But boy, what a fucking almost unique talent that he was in the business and a fascinating guy and a brilliant guy, intelligent guy. And I know a lot of people, oh, Ole, that grumpy old Ole. For a certain, if you liked sarcastic humor, if you liked a guy with that fucking. What the fuck are you talking about? Kind of goddamn approach to things. He was one of the funniest people in the locker room. He was witty and sarcastic with the comeback, and he'd just obliterate you, or he'd just, if if he saw bullshit in something as a owner or a booker that you were saying, whether he was even right or wrong, he would fucking not only tell you his bullshit, he would analyze the fucking consistency and the color of the bullshit and describe in vivid detail what it smelled like in front of everybody to your face. And you had almost few people that really had a, a response or could muster one, right? He was a very intelligent guy. And as we'll talk about as we go on, I don't think people understand he was one of the most successful wrestlers of all the, I'm talking business-wise, financially, and accomplishment-wise, of all of the wrestlers of the territory days from the TV era to the mid-80s, because a lot of people don't understand the business. But, um, I've, I mean, we've told a million stories, and I don't want to, for all the regular listeners, tell every goddamn chapter and verse uh, story again that's out there we've done wcw deep dives and stories of crockett days and blah 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 but as we've talked about only over the past couple of years i've said you know and especially you know in in hindsight going back as we've done those deep dives when i yelled at Ole and quit at WCW in 1990, I was just yelling at him because I Jim Hurd wasn't there. He was just the the office guy standing there. He did, as we mentioned, I don't think he particularly gave a shit either way, whether we were there or not, because he didn't give a shit about that job at that point in time anyway. He just wasn't going to fuck with Jim Hurd about minute shit. I think he knew it was a lost cause. What's it like to um, yell at Ole? Um, well, I, I'd done it a couple of times. It's not like I'm yelling at him saying, I'm going to come over and punch you in the face. I wasn't going to whip him. He can still whip me. He was 50 or whatever. And I was 25, but I'm going, Oh, this is fucking bullshit. And well, if you think it's bullshit, go home. Well, that's the best idea you've ever had. Well, <laughs> go ahead and do it then. Well, and that kind of, and well, and don't come calling me back when you're doing some kind of dog and pony show in Memphis. Don't worry, only I won't, because this is the last place I want to be. That type of, you know, 
I mean, that was pretty much goddamn some word for word shit there. But it's not like we were going to strangle each other over a payoff or something. You know, so, but there was, even when we were just uh, compadres in the locker room in 86 working for Crockett, remember at the time we were in Huntington, West Virginia at Civic Center, we're sitting in the locker room, the fucking uh, 86 bash checks had come out. And what did they, in 86, we did 14 bashes. And I think Ole and Arn, they were with the rock and roll most of those shows. And and that was a big, you know, marquee match. But I think, because Crockett paid all the bashes on one check. You got your regular date check weekly right along, but all the bash shows came in one check. So it would look bigger, right? So fewer people would complain. And Ole and Arn got like 15 grand for the 14 bashes and, and me and the midnight got, you know, 23 or what it, cause we were working either with Dusty and Magnum or the road warriors and blah, blah, blah. And Ole sitting there and, and, and baby doll, that was the key. It was Dusty and Magnum with baby doll and me, or the road warriors with baby doll and me. It was me and baby doll, right? That was, and, and it worked bless Dusty and Ole sitting there going, well, I never thought I'd, Live to see the day that I had my sweat and blood and tears in this business of work to build it up so that some fat manager and goofy cunt can come along and make more money than I did, you know. And I said, and only on behalf of the fucking goofy cunt, the fat manager would like to thank you for all that work you did and putting in me getting this fucking check. <laughs> and he started liking me for shit like that. How did he react because, to that specific comment? Did he chuckle? Like, how did he react? To yes, that? yes. Because it because you know, fuck, he he would it, it again, he wasn't firing me because I I'd fucked up Columbus, Georgia, and he was the fucking booker or something. But he had an admiration for people that could, you know, instead of well, fuck you, Ole, I hate your guts, could fucking make some kind of goddamn wise ass remark. And he would engage you. And so he liked that shit. And that's that's the point that I was making is I was never personally I don't think, only as we've said, he would never admit it probably, but by 1990, that stretch where he was the booker for six months, he'd, he'd lost, lost the plot, as they say, across the pond. And I don't think he really, he wasn't there because of financial necessity. Otherwise, then I think it was against, he, I don't know what other religion he might have had, but it was against his fucking religion to turn down guaranteed hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And, you know, but he didn't have any drive to, you know, break new booking ground and he was just doing some old shit again and he, he didn't have it. But in, in the seventies and some, to, to some extent, the early eighties, he had goddamn made a fortune with his booking. He just didn't give a shit and he didn't have full control and, and the guys didn't understand it. And I don't think he gave a shit because his check was the same either way. When he when it was depending on ticket sales whether he made any money or not, he made changes a lot quicker. He made some almost bizarre changes at times, like Roddy Piper getting fired from Georgia, like while he was in a top spot. Well, but the because I was such a fan of that, right? That whole and that's right as I was getting into business, and and I was such a fan of Piper and that whole angle, but the. A conversation that I got uh, when I first got in the locker rooms of, of guys that had been in the territory or had heard or whatever was that at that point in time, Roddy did not want to do anything, but because didn't he go to Continental right after that for just a brief period of time, Piper? He spent a minute in Florida, I know. Or Florida. He he got mad because at, at that point in time, as long as Roddy showed up for his match, he thought he didn't have to get there on time, and he just wanted to go somewhere where he could make $1,000 a week and, and do the things he was doing. And I think that's what went sideways with Ole, because they, the, the one thing about Ole, they joked when they actually brought up the idea of a fucking drug test in WCW for steroids, cocaine, whatever the fuck they said the only two guys on the roster that will pass that test is Ole Anderson and Jim Cornette unless you test for cholesterol 
because Ole wasn't going to goddamn do it. So that was, I think, him and Roddy may have got sideways on Roddy's habits. Because that's really the beginning of like the turn in Ole's creative powers. Because it was that, and then going into 83, he pushes Barnett out of Georgia, takes full control. Right. Just because the other partners weren't going to interfere with him at that point, which would end up, we know how that would end up. And look at the booking in Georgia in 83. It's easy to romanticize a lot of it. You know, Tommy Rich and Buzz Sawyer, the creation of the Road Warriors. No, it, but it was all over the page. The yeah. Road Warriors were an accident created out of necessity. It was all over the page because when Ole took full control, he loved Stan Hansen. So sure, Stan, I don't mind you go to Japan for a month at a time while I, I'll still figure you into big programs. Or Bill Eady, superstar. Yeah, we'll use you when you can be here because you're a great talent, but go to Japan for six weeks. So they do a mask versus mask or loser leave town or whatever the fuck. And, and then somebody'd be back in six weeks or it was all over the page. Things would stop suddenly. And Ole was running the whole company then. So then he, uh, and, and then with Barnett gone, Barnett could always be an anchor. Ole could, you know, he could be a great booker. I don't know that he was ever intended to run the entire show or not because he he had a even though he was a heartless bastard for the the guys that he liked that he knew had drawn him money he would give them too much leeway with their schedule because of what was going on in the business and georgia couldn't provide the biggest payoffs anymore and barnett would have probably had a little more stability with that or a little more power in in uh co convincing people to do otherwise and in, and then it all fell apart from there, and he lost the time slot, and blah blah blah. But it, but it, so the thing is, me well, he, and lost the only, the, he lost the company, not just the time. Well, he slot. lost the cut. Well, it lost the company and the TV and the whole nine yards. But he was so just to say with me and Ole, because I know somebody's going to say, "Oh, Cornette's saying good things about him." I would no, it, he was a representative of a, a larger evil. He was one of the devil's henchmen at the time that me and Ole really weren't happy with each other and when he wanted to put the pumpkin over my head that was three days ahead before that did he want to do that or did jim heard want him to tell well, to do that see that's the th he wasn't going to tell me well it ain't my idea because he you know he he's the booker and it's not he would have wanted to make everybody think all the goddamn ideas were his right because Oli was not the kind of person that would admit to being told to do something but they had the goddamn the guys dressing up. Well, was Jim Ross Dracula? Uh, Out of Missy Hyatt was in sub. Maybe Missy Hyatt was Vampirella. I don't know what the fuck was going. But the Vampirella. announcers were in. Who, who knows? I can't remember. The announcers were in costume. It's Halloween Havoc. Goddamn! I think dangerously is a vampire. Maybe. And they had the Southern boys run out dressed as caricatures of me with oversized tennis rackets. And they had me in the goddamn Confederate general uniform to taunt them. And Ole pitches me. And then they'll take one of the, because there's pumpkins and there's bales of fucking hay around. They'll take one of the pumpkins and they'll fucking hit you over the head with it and it'll stick on your head. So I'm going to be running around with a jack-o'-lantern on my fucking head, right? Not to mention the logistics of how big would this pumpkin have to be to cut a hole big enough to get it over my head without taking my fucking ears off. And I, I'd finally, I'd had enough because it's against Tommy Rich and Ricky Morton. We're, we're in the first match. It's Robert's knee was hurt, Gibson. So it's not midnight rock and roll. Now it's Tommy and Ricky, and they've never teamed up before on any television program at that point, and we're going to still do the job. And then I'm going to come out and interfere in the Southern boys, our rivals match and cause them to lose. So our program, both teams get beat by other teams. And then they're going to put a pumpkin over my head to erase any heat that, you know, I might've accumulated by fucking them out of something. I said, no, Ole, they're not going to put a pumpkin over my head. And he's well, they would have done it in Tennessee. You know, and Nick Goulas, he would have done it. I said, there's a difference. Ole Nick Goulas drew money. Oh, <laughs> Sick burn, as the kids say, because Ole hated Tennessee wrestling. Yeah, where did that come from, his hatred of Tennessee wrestling? Because it, despite the fact that he had never been there, 
Um, right. That's what I'm thinking. He's never, he never gets, worked for Nick Goulas, right? He, he never, well, uh, no, not even, no, no, not even in the sixties as a rookie. We'll get to that. Um, it was the concept and what people told him. Ah, oh, they got that fucking roughhouse Fargo over there. He never saw the TV because there was no fucking home video at that time. You didn't say uh, promoters, even, unless they sent footage of a guy who was film of a, was coming into your territory. You didn't see any film from any other territory unless you went there and watched it. So, but Ole was very serious minded. That's the way he and Gene got over and, and built their legacy was these guys are fucking real in a world that potentially might be bullshit. And it was, you know, even though he didn't mind guys with gimmicks, he wanted guys that their shit looked legitimate or they sounded legitimate or, you know, not, you're not going to do anything fucking outrageous. You're not going to break a bottle over a guy's head and he's up making a comeback in fucking five minutes or whatever shit like that. And then the, the predisposition to everybody that had ever worked for Nick Goulas to go around calling goddamn ah, Tennessee bullshit. Because they didn't like Nick, except for the people who made money in Tennessee, and they never left. So anyway, so that's where that came from, and and and, but again, you know, that's the Oli was trying to ever increasingly, you know, he always wanted control of his company or his booking or whatever. But I think that's where he lost it when he was like, I didn't pick these fucking guys. He couldn't just fire fucking guys. Because that's a lot of times when he worked for Ole, when people suddenly disappeared, he got mad and fired you. As he's mentioned many times, many people have said. But when he's he was working for TBS, he he inherited this fucking roster of guys. He's looking and seeing what they're making, and he knows what, He's paid talent that have drawn big money in the past, and they're they're overpaid. And he also sees that they're not drawing dick for a variety of reasons, and they're still getting that money, whether they practically show up or not. And that just, you know, I'm I'm sure he was ah. But that uh, the thing with Oli is, he wasn't hanging on because he needed the wrestling business. People kept asking him to come back and then he'd get in a spot. Well, they're going to, they're going to give me $150,000. And, and this is 30 years ago to a fucking goddamn book or whatever the fuck, whether I do any good at it or not. What the fuck? Right. But he had pretty much, I think it wasn't even, well, <laughs> Pretty much the last run that he wanted to have as a wrestler was 87, right? When he finally broke off from the horseman and switched babyface. He had intended to re be retired at that point, and they brought him back in 89 when the deal to get both Tully and Arn got screwed up by Jim Hurt. Am I correct on this in, in your uh, computer brain? He came back a little bit before then. Remember, they also brought him back, I want to say, for one night at the Omni. Him and Luger teamed up after Luger turned babyface in 88. And yes. All of a sudden, they had yes, Ole in the main did. event on the Omni with Luger. Uh, in 89, remember, he was the, oh, uh, what was the, the designated enforcer for the Halloween Havoc Thunderdome match. That's right. It was him and Gary Hart, and then he punched Gary Hart, causing him to throw his White Towel in, and Bruno San Martino thought that was it. Yeah. So he was there a little bit before then. Someone had already well, made the decision to bring him in. Yeah, well, it, it was Flair. And and that's the thing is that he knew that, or Flair thought he knew that Tully and Arn were coming back, so you would have four horsemen, right? But that's, uh, the, the point is that Ole was 81. That means he was born in, what, 1922 at this point. He was making big 1922, money. Or 1922. 1942. Shit, 1942. I'm sorry. What year is this, Jim? Oh, God damn it. I misspoke. I didn't miss add. I misspoke. Can we get a cognitive test for Mr. Cornette, please? Yeah, hey, I'll tell you what. I'll fucking, you examine this head. You'll find nothing. He, by the time the late 60s, he's 25 years old. He was making good money and on top in the wrestling business. And... By 10 years, pretty much uh, 10 years in or so, he's booking. 
He ends up having a run where he books not only the Carolinas, which was, again, a phenomenal wrestling territory that was consi did consistent business for all those years, but he was booking Georgia at the same time. And the Anderson brothers, as main event talent, were going back and forth between those two territories. And by the late 70s, early 80s, what, whatever, whenever he bought the piece of Georgia for Watts's piece, he now he owns part of the company. That was in 15 years. When he was um, in the mid-80s, when he was working for Crockett and then switched babyface, and then the late 80s came back to WCW, he had gone back to Minnesota during that period of time because he owned a sawmill. Some people used to call it a lumber yard, but I don't, it wasn't like Lowe's. It was a sawmill that prepared lumber to go to the people that sold lumber. He Because everybody would always ask, hey, Ole, how's the lumber business? Or whatever. Ah, I got, damn, got a sawmill. But I mean, in this, obviously, you don't just own a fucking sawmill for a hobby. He was making money with that. He had made a fucking fortune for the territory days in the business. We've talked about this before, but when you take into account it, what he was making in the late 70s, in, in most of the territory, he was in comparable terms with anybody but Andre, the NWA champion, and Bruno. Because he could, between his booking pay for a territory like the Carolinas that ran sometimes three shows a night in those days, and the booker got uh, small percentages off each of the shows, as well as his main event pay for him and Gene being on top, or then later on him and Hanson, or him and whoever, you know, whatever heel he was teamed with. And then Georgia, too, he was making a quarter of a million dollars a year in the late 70s. Gross, but that's uh, close to a million dollars in today's money. And that's what, there was a great article, I think it was Greg Oliver, um, who's done a bunch of the Hall of Fame uh, books and articles. Um, and when they called Ole, some Hall of Fame called Ole. Oh, yeah, that's actually from the Wrestling Review. That's from, uh, it's something yes. I own, Greg reprinted it. It's a great article. Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned you own that, because now you can probably done Greg for a fucking percentage of it. But yes, there'll probably be a wrestling review collection coming out at some point soon. I'll oh, wink, wink, nod, nod, possibly available at Jim Uh, but anyway, he wrote the article talking about when some hall of fame called only to say they want to induct him. And what was the premise? He asked, well, why, why have you inducted me before? Well, who's in before <laughs> me or what, whatever only would do. Right. And the guy told him, well, you know, you were big in the Carolinas, you know, in Georgia, but you never, you never really worked anywhere else. You weren't big anywhere else. And he's, what kind of fucking moron are you? Why would I want to go anywhere else? I was doing so well there. Well, that was the fight he had with Dave Meltzer on the old Wrestling Observer radio show years ago. Okay. Dave had him on and Ole had just put out his book with Scott Teal, which is a fascinating book to read. It's yes. certainly Ole's perspective of things. And there was a chapter, which was like two pages, about Dave not putting him in the first class of the Hall of Fame and the voters not voting him in. And then he went on with Dave, and that was one of the things, you didn't go to enough places. And he's like, <laughs> you know, he's one of these people, it's like, I got into this business to make money, I didn't have to go anywhere. Why would, like Bruno, why would Bruno leave what he's doing here to go somewhere yeah. else? Well, and see, that's the thing. That's why I mentioned he was so unique and one of the most successful guys in the territory days when you think about it, in the territories system, when you started in the business, unless you were getting a push because you were some, you know, uh, other professional sport attraction or whatever the fuck, you started like a regular guy. You would go from territory to territory and hopefully work your way up the cards, get more experience, get better, see if somebody sees you, give you a gimmick, and you go from making the least amount of money in the preliminaries to the most amount of money in the main events. But even then, you can still be a bigger star in a bigger territory because the guys making main event money in the Kansas City territory, that might have been level of the underneath preliminary guys in the Carolina territory. You wanted to be a big star in all the territories, right? 
but it was almost never a career you could even possibly plan, much less actually intend to do, where you would just go to one or two places and suddenly you would get to be such a big star in that location, making so much money for so long that you would either own part of the thing or you'd never be asked to leave or want to leave. And that would be the Brunos and the Jerry Lawlers and the goddamn Vern Gagnas and the very few other people, right? Because, and Ric Flair to Carolinas. And that's like the goddamn, you know, because there were some that's guys. That's the dream, isn't it? Isn't it yeah. the wrestler's dream? I don't have to go too far from home and I'll make all this money? In the territory days, think about this. It wasn't just a wrestler, you know, going from territory to territory in, in the twinkling of an eye. It's if he's married, if he's got kids, wife has to go, the, the kids have to go, unless you're going to keep two residences in two different parts of the country. And some of these guys would be in the business for 15 or 20 years, and they would make enough money to make a living but they would be in two or three territories every year rotating around. Sometimes they could stay for six months or nine months or whatever. Sometimes it might be three months or who knows what might happen. And as different schools and apartments and all this bullshit. And, and then when you get to be a star to the level that, promoters want you to work all over the country then you're in the main events and then they're flying you places and you're making main event money and picking your spots that's a whole different deal but for somebody to be able to go and not only be a featured main event attract because when Ole replaced the original minnesota wrecking crew in the carolinas was gene anderson and lars anderson and for whatever purposes that Lars needed replacing when he went out uh, somewhere else, they bring in Ole. And think about this, a guy that had been trained by Vern Gagne, kind of in Eddie Sharkey in that system in Minnesota. They need a replacement in the Carolinas. And they get this guy, Rock Rogowski, who, who grows a mustache out and looks enough like he's Swedish out of Ole Anderson, I don't know what the fuck, that he can be, you know, Gene Anderson's partner, and he's a big, tough, legitimate fucking guy. But then that starts the Minnesota-Carolina pipeline. Flair to the Carolinas. The Road Warriors, when, when Ole needs somebody on the sperm of the moment, and they and you know Sharky is oh I got these fucking guys and that you know how many people followed that, but Ole was probably the first right. What sixty eight or so he he joined Gene. He came over early and again he always kept that good relationship with Vern Gagne too. He would still talk glowingly about Vern, you know, till the very end. So they yeah. always had that good relationship and you know it is interesting when you like I go through my files I did the other day after Ole passed and. You look at the Andersons and all these pictures of Gene and Lars, and it's almost a different team just in terms of the feel altogether. They call them Rock Rogowski for a reason. He wasn't on the gas or anything. He was just a naturally big guy who lifted weights. He was like a rock, as opposed to Lars, who, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, you know, Lars who was Lars. I always looked like Lars. I always love when uh, Ole turned on Dusty and then he's like, my, my foolish brother Lars, whatever he yeah. said. He threw out some line about Lars. But yeah, that opened up the pipeline. Well, and and also the thing is, Gene and Lars were established as, a, and we've talked about the Carolinas being a tag team territory. And they would, you know, rotate a lot of, you know, Nelson Royal and Tex McKenzie and Johnny Weaver and George Becker and the Kentuckians and the, the Bolos and the, et cetera, et cetera, who were the assassins. And, you know, the Andersons fit right in there, but when Ole came in, they were somewhat already established, but they got bigger from there. And I think Ole, because, we, I mean, we've talked about Gene, what a believable fucking guy he was. And, you know, when he, he was an almost 50-year-old fucking stroke survivor who was pudgy and smoked like a chimney and balding 
And he he could walk up by by the barbarian and give him that fucking grip I've talked about on the elbow, whatever that fucking pressure point, the nerve, the bones, uh, thumb and fucking middle finger, any dev barb on the floor or any other grown man I ever saw. That no, Gene, please, I'm a pussy. Say you're a pussy. I'm a pussy, Gene. Anything, let me go. They weren't working with him. All the fans knew that Gene was legitimate. He trained a bunch of guys that w- broke in in the Carolinas in those days but he wasn't a great promo. When they made him a manager, it was because the fans had such respect slash fear for what he might be able to do to somebody. Uh, But it was because after he'd had the health problems, when Ole, and you've heard Lars Anderson's promos, Jesus, Mary and Joseph. So when Ole came in, one of the great, legitimate, big, bully, sarcastic, literate though logical emotional promos in all of wrestling and he could stand there and tell you anything and you you might not even believe it but you would swear on your life that this guy saying it believed it and really meant everything he was saying and he was just so real as a fucking windbag prick and a bully and a blowhard and a fucking egotistical whatever the fuck right that's what got i think the andersons to the next level and the work and then you know that's what when i was there in the mid 80s and this was 15 years after you know only had started all the fans would talk about great tag teams and whether they mentioned you know, the rock and roll or the midnight or whether it's back to Flair and Valentine or Steamboat and Youngblood or whatever, they would mention different teams because there had been so many great teams, tag team territory. But almost every, the first one would be the Andersons because they were like, okay, it was the Andersons and then everybody else came up. You know, and that's why they never left. They just fed guys to them. And they drew in all those towns regularly for fucking years and years. As a fan, before you got into the business, and we've talked about it in the past, we'll talk about it again briefly, but you know, one of the things you attended was the night that he turned on Dusty Rhodes, that Gene turned on Dusty Rhodes. Yes. Omni in Atlanta in 1980. But before we even get there, what was it like for you when you rescued those tapes, tapes, those films? Yeah. And had them transferred. Oh. And for the first time, you're seeing all this stuff, which is really the classic Anderson Brothers period. Yeah, it, well, it was, I have, I got goosebumps right now, um, you know, running up and down my spine. No, this was stuff that we didn't know still existed and that, you know, had never been seen before because it was before the days of home video and all that stuff. And, you know, it was the all of those guys in their prime, but with the Andersons, you can see they were different than everybody else because they... Well, you you saw a bit of it in Ole's work in the 80s in terms of if a baby face was going to make a comeback or even gain any ground, they really had to fucking fight. They really had to fucking ex- assert themselves to fight. And then if, you, if they got enough, if Ole and Gene got enough, they'd start backing up. You can't see me, but I'm rocking in my seat now. And <laughs> they... You know, if Ole was hanging onto your fucking wrist and you punched him in the head, his fucking body language, he'd he'd register it, but like punching a bull, but he hit him the second time and his knees would wobble. But he hit him a third time and his his body's starting to sag, but he's going down to a knee, but he's still holding, he won't let go of the fucking wrist. They made the baby faces fight for shit and the people got with it more. And then they were more, yes, they were basic, but when Ole came off the top rope, he would jump off the top rope and either do the knee to the arm, which never blew his knees on all those shitty rings doing that. And when you land, it's more dangerous than what he was doing to the fucking opponent. Um, Or just to hammer or club somebody and they'd slam on the arm and they'd quick tag in and out. And the sacrifice thing where, you know, they did it in several big moments. They didn't overuse it because, see, that's another thing. They stayed in the same territory all those years they didn't have once in a lifetime, one in a million fucking fluke spots that they overdid to the point of prostitution because people saw them all the time. They had to just fight and wrestle and get people behind the fucking match. And they did that the same place for years and years. But the sacrifice thing, 
where all would be lost and suddenly if Gene was hanging on the ropes or whatever or leaning into the ring, Ole would grab the baby face and run the baby face's head head first into fucking Gene. And remember, that's the, the fucking same thing that fucked Dynamite Kid up in the uh, Bulldogs match in where, the garden or wherever? Oh, he did was that, he, well, he did that spot at WrestleMania too. That was the finish. They rammed, uh, I want to say, Valentine uh, into Dynamite Kid's head and he went flying yeah. off the apron into the crowd, or not the crowd, but all the way Onto to the, the floor, floor. and yeah. they missed it. They missed the shot of it. They missed the shot, but Dynamite didn't miss the floor, and that's what fucked his back up. Well, Valentine gave him that finish because they got it from the Anderson brothers. And but and that maybe that's why Gene later in life had the stroke and or muscle spasms, because they did it a number, but that's that's the kind of they would go to any lengths to win a match, right? The Andersons. Mean, cruel, and nasty. And that's a I mean, that's why that they had that level of heat. When Ole was stabbed in Greenville, that was, was that 1976, maybe? Whatever the point is, he'd been working Greenville on a weekly basis in the Carolinas for almost 10 years at that point. He still had enough heat that this guy wanted to kill him, literally tried to kill him, stabbed him a half inch from his heart. And, you know, you don't get that by goddamn being phony. When you watch those films after you had him transfer, what did you also think? Because I'm fascinated by babyface Ole Anderson, because those promos are amazing. Yes. Just his ability to communicate is amazing. But what did you think of babyface Ole? Well, that's also with the transfers, one thing I was going to mention, was, and, and, and Ole could do either one because he could talk and make you believe that he was a, an evil bully because everything he said made sense and it sounded like he meant it, but he could also talk and make you believe that he was in the right in a particular situation because he could logically communicate that. So it was, it, and he never said it. He didn't suddenly start, oh, I'm only going to do a headlock. He would still do his Ole Anderson shit. So it was a heel getting a taste of his own medicine. But another thing about the transfers of the films to watch the people to watch the people yeah. in the various venues in that territory that saw wrestling again either every week or every two weeks at that point in time, and they would go absolutely batshit insane for these wrestling stars that they saw on all the shows, but they were so over, and they were so into the wanting to see their hero win and their their the villain lose and people get their comeuppance and the fucking, you know, what's going to happen? Boy, we want revenge for whatever's been done to our guy. They just, they're jumping up and down, screaming, throwing umbrellas, popcorn, babies in the air. You, I mean, all the territory crowds, most of them, any good territories, they had their hot moments, but they also, you know, but it for a, long period of time the Carolinas was wrestling crazy and the guys that were on top either had an inordinate amount of heat or were just you know the people that hung the moon and the end that's that's why when as I said when you know when Ole got there he never had and Georgia was the 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 NWA territory next door and obviously even though it was one state much smaller schedule than the Carolinas with three towns a night through North and South Carolina and Virginia, part of West Virginia, Barnett, one of the most powerful people in the business. So he would annex some of the talent and the, the, you know, the Pipers or whoever would appear on both. It was a great payoff for Jim Crockett senior and juniors talent to come down to either be featured in the Atlanta shows or later on, on the Omni. And when TBS got, you know, the superstation or got to be a superstation. So there was, if you were on top in both those territories, you could make, you know, as I mentioned, a couple or $3,000 a week in those days, just wrestling. Well, actually some of the guys, the Carolinas in the late seventies, Flair and Valentine were making close to 150 grand a year, just in the Carolinas. So uh, that was, <laughs> You didn't need to go anywhere. And then Ole, he, he becomes a booker. He's making extra money, and then he becomes part owner. 
so that's a if Ole was never he didn't drink uh he i'm I, he Ole was as much of a fan of women as anybody ever in the wrestling business but he didn't chase women to a stupid degree and spend a fortune on them he didn't spend a fortune on any fucking thing his his t-shirt with his goddamn you know, evil, mean, and nasty, or whatever. That was a rib because Ole Anderson wasn't going to spend money on a goddamn ring jacket. So he was independently wealthy and didn't need to do this by the time the mid '80s rolled around. Well, before we get to the mid '80s, 1980, the turn in Atlanta. Yes, of uh, <laughs> the only match you didn't shoot the, ringside for. That well, night. and and that was the thing. The WFIA Wrestling Fans International Association convention that year's in in the uh, uh georgia and the highlight of the weekend of any of the conventions was you went to the territory's main you know building to to see when the memphis convention we went to the mid-south coliseum knoxville went to knoxville civic coliseum atlanta we're going to the omni so that weekend we saw a, a tbs television taping we saw a spot show in god i think it it shit where was it? it may have been Carrollton, georgia and uh, the, we had the banquet, and we were at the Omni. And I was there at ringside for all the other matches. It was Harley Race against Tommy Rich for the NWA world title. And uh, uh, Dutch Mantel worked with Chavo Guerrero. The first time I saw anybody do a fucking moonsault, body block off the top was Chavo. And a number of other matches, but there was one match that was the cage match and I had forgotten and got there. I didn't have any high speed film. You can't shoot that chain link cage with a fucking flash because it fucks everything up. And I say, you know what? I'm going to go back up and sit with weasel and my mom is there and, uh, and you know, and just watch the cage match instead of shoot at ringside. When did you learn that lesson? Was there a specific match uh, or example where you learned that you can't shoot cage matches? Yes, uh, like the that? first uh, the first time that uh, you know the the chicken wire was okay that we had in Louisville for all those years, but the first time I went to a place that actually had a real fucking cyclone fence cage, it just looked like shit. It throws not only does the light reflect, but it threw the the automatic exposure setting that you had back then. It threw that off. And so the background inside the cage was dark, blah, blah, blah. And so I started shooting 400 speed film, no flash with cage matches. But because of the hecticness, I, I got no high speed film. Nobody else. Ah, fuck it. I'll sit this one out. I'm tired. I'm so tired. And luckily, because they had a fucking riot, because it was the culmination of the Year, year and a half long deal they had done, Ole had turned babyface. And he had started teaming up with Tommy Rich. And he had teamed up with Mr. Wrestling too, And he had teamed up with, but Dusty Rhodes would never agree to be his tag team partner because of the animosity from them from, you know, the years previous. And they even, they would show the fucking clip of Dusty. It will never be over. And so finally, the Assassins, the hottest heel team, at least of the modern era in Georgia wrestling at that point in time. Maybe in Georgia wrestling history. Maybe in time. Georgia wrestling history. Finally, it's the Assassins, and they have fucked with Ole. And they've, the, uh, Ivan Koloff is a heel. He's on the Assassin's side. And, and Gene Anderson had been out of the picture, had been away from the territory. Ole would later say that Gene had left the territory because he couldn't bear to see who I was associating myself with. <laughs> His do-gooder brother Lars. That's what he called him. Yeah, my do-gooder. My do-gooder do brother Lars. But Ole, Ole had problems with the assassins and Ivan Koloff and he needed help. And Dusty had had problems with the assassins. And finally... They they shot some kind of, I can't even remember what, but they really did something to Dusty, and Dusty came and agreed to be Ole's partner so they could get rid of the assassins. And so this had been like a, a year, year and a half in the building of this to get 
Even though Ole had been a straight baby face and all the others had teamed up with him and there was no hint of a betrayal of anybody, Dusty wouldn't have anything to do with him. And finally, they have the match. And then they have a rematch. And then as the classic promo, everybody's heard it. I used to hand it out in OVW. The promo that Ole did uh, the week after this incident we're talking about to explain it all was the, one of the great ones in the history of professional wrestling by anybody. He said, I got an idea. What about a cage, Dusty? We could keep those assassins in with a cage, and the idiot went for it. Ole suggests the cage match with the assassins, and Dusty agrees to it. And the two referees are Gene Anderson and Ivan Koloff. And so the match starts and they're, you know, they're wrestling, they do their thing, and it was a cage match, and it's fine, and people are liking it, and and then finally they start getting some heat on on Ole, and they get him down, and there's not really much going on. It's not like they're killing him or anything. And then finally, but the people want to see Dusty make the tag, and finally... I no, I'm sorry. I tell a lie. They did it the other way around. It they happened got quick, they, didn't it? Yeah, they they didn't get heat on. I was thinking of another time. They got heat on Dusty straight away. They they did some shining, but then they got the heat on Dusty, and he was milking getting the tag to Ole. And finally, Dusty does get the tag to Ole, and that's when Ole jumps in, and looks at the assassins, and turns around. And goddamn starts wailing on Dusty. And then at that point, Gene drops any pretense of being, you know, against the other guys. And he starts getting on Dusty. And everybody... And, well, and little detail that was awesome. The assassins look at each other like, what is happening here? Yeah, yeah. At first, they're like, oh, okay, we'll just all goddamn <laughs> And, well, you know, once they realize they're not in really a fight anymore, and now they're in the cage and there's... Uh, one, two, three, four, there's five of them and Dusty. And they're killing Dusty in the cage in the Omni in Atlanta. And the people got hot. And then the, it turned more desperate because the, they started sending the boys out, the wrestlers, the underneath guys, to start. And they can't get in. They're shaking the door. The door is locked. The door, they, they can't. The referee, it was the referees are in the ring and they've got the fucking keys and everything, blah, blah, blah. And so the underneath guys start trying to climb the cage and then the heels in the ring get up on the ropes and they're hitting their hands so they can't climb the cyclone fence and they're knocking the baby faces off the fucking cage. And this is really creating a goddamn element of jeopardy while they're still working on Dusty and breaking his leg or whatever they were doing in the middle of the ring. The other ones are keeping the baby faces from. And that's when you, you know, uh, Lars is out there because Lars had been presented as a baby face even though by that point his, his glory days were long behind him. And finally, some of the fans get, they create such a sense of, of urgency to this that the fans start trying to climb the God. Now the heels are hitting the cage for real. Oh shit. Don't let those motherfuckers get over the top. And that's when I think they got the bolt cutters or whatever they fucking did. And they got the door open and a bunch of the baby faces pour in. And this is always an awkward moment because there's only one door in those old cages and it was only like three feet wide. So the heels have to stand the baby faces off. The baby faces have to go to the injured baby face. They're saving and look like they're trying to do something, but the heels got to get out the same door. They just came in and, those baby faces had to do something. So they're wailing on the goddamn heels as they're trying to get out that door. And that's uncomfortable as fuck. I've been in that position. And then the goddamn, the once the heels get out on the floor, the cops are shitting because the whole arena is in an uproar. And it wasn't sold out that night, but I it, it looked great to me because it was the first time I'd ever been there. But I'm going to say, was there 12,000 people there? Ted wouldn't have been out of the way. 10 or 12,000, they're fucking pissed. And the floor area, and in the Omni, I may have mentioned, you had to walk down an, an aisleway and then kind of cut to a diagonal further aisleway to get underneath to the locker room. So they can't get the goddamn heels out. It, they've been in the cage for a while now, 
and they still can't get the heels out of there. And then they just, all the cops circle them as a run and they got the shit beat out of them. It was a, it was fucking chaos, but that got the, um, it got the point across. And of course the videos out there, I think it's called the big turn of 1980. And it is an extraordinary video because the way they covered it is one of the, it's an, it's an amazing clip because they show the footage and they have all the wraparound interviews while Oli's in a studio. And I forget who walked away at the beginning, maybe Walter Johnson or who was it? Someone walked um, away and they said, you'll get yours one day, Ole Anderson. And he goes, not from you. Yeah, not from <laughs> you. Remember the interview I was telling you about where the guy for the football player forgot all the guy's names? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, then, and then Ole said, just go on. Just get out of here. Nobody wants to hear from you. Just leave. Uh, but, but anyway, so that's, unfortunately, I think Ole is more remembered for being a grumpy bad booker in 1990 or whatever than he is for being one of the great fucking heel talents in the business and one of the most successful guys of the territory days you know that that he should be remembered for because most of that stuff is not not around anymore and 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 in the public eye or where people trip over it and are forced to look at it and of course, when you would go to Crockett, he would be there and you would see him. And that was his, the end of his run. He, I guess the rumor is that he took all the Georgia master tapes and burned them in his yard when Vince McMahon <laughs> got the company. And it sounds believable because of who it is. He wanted to have a blood oath with the Briscoes. I don't know. It, with Ole again, you know, maybe he put them in a goddamn shed just to hide them, and he was going to deny any knowledge of where they were, and they rotted rather than because I'm thinking he he he's got a figure he could have made some money out of them sometime or other, but but that's why. And, and of course, I was the first time I ever got fired in the wrestling business, and fuck the last time for the next twenty two years, I guess they out would, uh, was only because when he closed the whole territory down in Georgia, we did the summer of 83 for six glorious weeks. And, and he closed the territory at the classic line to Dundee and Ron West. Don't do this anymore. What the, the interviews? No, any of it. And it was, <laughs> everything's canceled. <laughs> okay. But he, when, when I first came to Crockett, Think about what Ole thinks of me, because I guarantee goddamn to you that Ole Anderson did not watch any pro wrestling on television in his spare time or any wrestling that he was not involved with that he had to watch for business if he was Booker or whatever, or potentially even if he did a television show. I don't imagine he'd probably watch himself by this point, right? So the only time that he has ever seen me before I come to work for Jim Crockett Promotions where I'm managing the new top heel tag team that's coming in the territory with their manager, a guy named Jim Cornette, I worked for him for six weeks, two summers previously, where the most notable thing I did on his fucking Chattanooga studio television show that he was never even there in person for was get my face shoved in a cake while conducting a birthday party for my dog. And, and, and what, the whole time he's blaming Nick Goulas. That's the funny thing. Well, well, there you go. <laughs> yes. Well, cause, <laughs> and here's the thing. Because they told me, Ronnie West and Dundee, because they, they were the only ones that actually saw Ole, right? When we were working there, Ole wasn't coming around those fucking towns. But they would go in once a week and have the meeting with him. And... He didn't like the birthday party for the dog. They came back and said, oh, fucking Ole hates you. He hated the birthday party. So when I met him the next week, because when, when we did the local promos, it was in the, the Omni, the offices that the Georgia wrestling office had. And, you know, he, he could stroll by. And I met him that, that next week after the birthday, which was two weeks before he came in and said, don't do this anymore. And he said, uh, Ah, you're Cornette. I said, Ole, it's nice to meet you. I saved you a piece of cake. He said, oh, yeah? I said, it's in my ear. <laughs> and that's the last interaction I had with Ole Anderson until I walked into Crockett being the manager of the top heel tag team. You know, speaking of interactions, I guess 
for a lot of the younger fans or people who discovered a lot of these guys on tapes or later on on DVD and then actually really on YouTube, Ole became known as the grumpy guy in various shoot interviews and documentaries where he would say what he would say. You know, he told Vince McMahon to go fuck himself. Then he said the same thing to Linda. Yeah. He bragged well, no, about hold, it. Hold on now. Don't gloss over it. <laughs> Vince said after the the unpleasantness over the Georgia office, Vince was at a place with Linda. And he said, Ole said, got my wife Linda here. I'd like you to meet her. And he said, fuck you and fuck Linda. See, the funny thing, too, is Vince McMahon went everywhere with lots of bravado. And he dealt with a lot of tough, strong personalities. He tried to take down Harley Race in a bathroom. Yeah. And he got his ass kicked. When he went down to Georgia after everything, he brought Gorilla Monsoon as his bodyguard. That's the only time he went with <laughs> someone because he was afraid something could happen. <laughs> right? Think about that. That's true. And Ole is the only one that would and never at any point before, during, or after his unpleasant dealings with Vince McMahon, did he ever goddamn soften up as, well, Vince, you know, I, at least we can look back on those days. No, fuck you and fuck Linda and fuck your kids. You fucked me and I don't need you and I won't buddy up to you and I'm not going to forgive you for it. See, Vince counted on that from the entire industry. I fucked you. You know it but you have to come work for me. And maybe we'll get along, it'll be great, but you'll be working for me and I'll be in charge. Yeah. <laughs> Very few people said, go fuck yourself yeah. <laughs> over and over and over again, like Ole Anderson did, which is even makes it even more surprising that WWE Raw, I guess this shows a lot about the change of management there. Yeah. They put up a very nice graphic and talked about him a little bit. Yes, and of course you could tell Michael Cole had to look down to refer to his notes when he said, the menace, nobody will ever forget the... Minnesota Wrecking Crew. That's the answer we were looking for. But no, you want to pay tribute to Ole Anderson, a wrestler yeah, no. I've never heard of before. <laughs> no, but it was nice. They did a tribute to him on there. Uh, AEW ended up combining his and Virgil's tribute together during the ring entrance, I think, for the Orange Cassidy match. And all I'm thinking is, boy, if Ole Anderson was alive oh for this. Oh, my God. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I'm, I'm old. I need to save my money because it's all downhill from here. But I'll guarantee goddamn tea. I won't spend a lot of money on too much these days, but I would give someone every penny I had to just have a video, much less be there in person, of two hours of Ole Anderson in the AEW locker room. That would be the... Fuck Richard Pryor, Chris Rock, Carlin can get... No, that would be the funniest fucking material that any off the top of his head that would be the greatest fucking performance in the history of wrestling. <laughs> so, and of course, he gave me the greatest compliment I've ever had. I will memorialize this one more time in your memory, Ole. Is it Cornette? I used to think you were a dumb fuck, but so many other dumb fucks have come along that are worse than you are, and you've moved up the ladder without doing anything. And for Ole, that was glowing praise. You have to think that's his way of saying, I like you. You're doing good. Yes. <laughs> I had to somehow impressed, <laughs> impressed him in some fashion that I was now not the biggest dumb fuck he's ever seen. You know, I saw Ric Flair put out a very nice tweet, and obviously he doesn't do his own tweets. He has someone who does it for him. But, you know, they had a big falling out. I think Ole lent him money, and whatever happens, happens, and they had a major falling out. But Flair acknowledged, you know, I was brought in as an Anderson. That's what got me over, really. Yeah. Was being an Anderson in Mid-Atlantic, and it's all because of Ole. And that's because being from... Well, th I mean, it's this is as simple as it was in those days, and it worked. Everybody in the Carolinas knew that the Anderson brothers, the Minnesota Wrecking Crew, are from Minnesota. When they bring this kid in from Minnesota, the... And it, at that point, it was George Scott, but I'm sure, you know, all the Crockett's agreed and et cetera. The best way to get somebody over is to align them with the Anderson brothers. Here's somebody from Minnesota. He's the cousin. He's the cousin of the Andersons. And that gave him instant fucking heat that he was just related to those goddamn low life people. In the in in the fans' eyes, and they needed to keep track of who the family was because Arn Anderson at one point was Ole's cousin, his yeah. nephew, yeah. And then eventually his brother. 
Well, I think that's when they start realizing, oh, wait a minute, Arn's not, Arn looked older than he was, and to be Ole's nephew, Jesus, how old is Ole? So <laughs> became his but, but yeah, Flair, I think, was always a cousin. Our cousin, Ric Flair. And we talk about it getting Flair over in Mid-Atlantic or being one of the things that led to it. Arn Anderson, Marty Lundy, was a very talented undercard wrestler, did some work for Mid-South on TV was working, obviously, in his home area. Becoming Arn Anderson immediately lent him credibility. And when people talk about the Anderson look, because various other people throughout time since then, like all of a sudden it's like, here's Bill Anderson. I shouldn't, that's a, there really is a Bill Anderson. There, that, well, that. our country music star, Bill Anderson, would like to have a word with you, but I know the point you were stre stretching to make. It's Ole's look. Like the classic yeah. Anderson look, it's Ole's look. It's not like this guy looks like Gene, this guy looks like Lars. It's no, this guy's a beard and a mustache and he's going bald. He's an well, yeah, and, and I think Arn will be the one to tell you that, I mean, Arn is a, was a fabulous worker in his career and was one of the premier talkers, but neither one of those things, his work got him noticed, but the thing that enabled him to get the spot that he got to show his talents was that he happened to look like fucking Ole. If he'd have had no resemblance to Ole, I don't know if they would have taken the goddamn you know, they would have wanted to do something with him, but I don't know if they would have taken the the time and the care and, and gone to that level to make him an Anderson brother and put him in a spot like that or an Anderson family member. If he hadn't looked like Ole, he wouldn't have got that opportunity. Hey, one more story before, I know we've gone a while here, but, you know, Ole was there when you left WCW. You were there when Ole got fired from WCW. <laughs> and it, you played a part in it. Well, and it, and it, well, I don't mean in a bad way, no. but it was only <laughs> but trying I, to. I can't say I can't say I wasn't even there because I was there. But it was only trying to get his son set up so he could start in a business the right way, and it ended up costing him his WCW job. Although he didn't really seem to be too upset about it. Well, and I, it it it, it may be also romanticizing it to say that it cost him his job. Bischoff was that was part of the story. I will tell it. <laughs> rather than beat around the bush about it, but Bischoff was waiting for an opportunity, a reason, or just the time where he was far enough away from Ole to fire him. So that it just came up while I was in the middle of it. But uh, Ole and Eric Bischoff, obviously, for a variety of reasons, and you can go read his book, I'm not going to quote him chapter and verse, didn't get along with each other or have probably the same outlook on the wrestling business, but Ole had been at that point, because he had a contract of some description, you know, he had been the booker and he'd been in management when Bischoff made his play for it. Only it ended up, he's working in the power plant and as a trainer and or, you know, what, director of special projects. Steve Hirsch, the head of Vivid Video, the porn company. So whenever they had a girl on the roster that they, it was their girlfriend, but they wanted to put her on the payroll and get her a job. They'd make her director of special projects. So he was just hanging around with not a lot of pull on anything. And they had been training Ole's, Ole was, too many pronouns, pal. And Ole, at the same time, Bryant, his son, Bryant Rogowski, had been training to wrestle and had one of the power plant contracts, whatever they call them, developmentals. So. I guess as part of the heat, uh, they either cut Bryant or let his deal expire. They didn't give him a chance to do anything or whatever. And that this was the point where I was running Smoky Mountain. Knoxville and Atlanta are 200 miles apart. And it's been so long since I've thought of the initiation of it. I think Ole called me, did he not? Or how did I get... How did I get notified about that? He, he, he must have, because you wouldn't have been yeah. calling there like, hey, do you have any guys that they just yeah, cut? I hadn't, hadn't talked to Ole since, he <laughs> fucking, since I yelled at him and walked out on him fucking four years beforehand. So, uh, But anyway, I say, you know what? To have uh, the son of Ole Anderson in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, especially if Ole said, I'll, I'll cut some promos and introduce him for you. Now I'm going to get Ole Anderson on Smokey about wrestling TV. Yes, I'm interested. And he told me Bryant's background. He was not only a big kid, and, and he had the Anderson look. He had the fucking mustache. He looked like 
Ole and also he could wrestle and was a big kid and obviously didn't have any goofy or unrealistic expectations of what the business was because he's Ole's son. And since then, by the way, he's had a successful business career and, and personal life and is a well thought of member of the community down there in North Georgia, I believe. So, you know, it's probably better that the wrestling thing went away. Bryant, I'm talking about. But anyway, so what I did was I said, look, I got these shows this weekend, then I will come down to Atlanta and I'll bring the camera. And let's shoot some interviews with you introducing Bryant. Because I didn't expect at that time that he would be able to come to my television. He still he works for WCW, right? He's not going to be able to come to fucking Hurley, Virginia to my TV taping. I said, where do you want me to meet you at a hotel or we do, you know, what? No, I'll come to the power plant. What? <laughs> come on down. I'll, we'll shoot it in the parking lot. <laughs> I said, oh, God damn it. Here we go. I'm like, I'll be there. So he gives me the directions and I drive down Jim Cornette. Now we know that there's issues between me and WCW. And at, at that time, I think Bischoff was aware that, yes, because I'd specifically at Super Brawl 3, I'd specifically told him that I blamed him for altering our angle and told him he was the reason we wouldn't be back and didn't trust anybody in the fucking place, right? So this is like November of 94, October, whatever. So I pull in the parking lot. And I park and I go up and I see Jody Hamilton. Hey, Jody, how you doing? Blah, 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 blah. I said, Terry Taylor. Hey, Terry, how you doing? And Terry excuses himself to go somewhere. Yeah, to make a phone call, I'm sure. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> Oh. And then here's Oli and, and, uh, and Oli tells Jody, Jody, I'm taking lunch. So we go out in the parking lot and, and Oli tells the first thing he says to me, he says, Eric Bischoff has not been the power plant. Now, Eric Bischoff has not been in this place in six weeks. I guarantee you, if you're here an hour, you'll see him. Because it wasn't like it was next door, the CNN Center in downtown Atlanta, the regular office. This was out like in suburban northeastern, whatever the fuck, I can't remember. So it took a minute, you know, in between. So we're shooting the interviews, and I've got my tripod and my little eight millimeter, high eight millimeter camera, and uh, and Oli's and Brian are talking on my pencil microphone, uh, taped to a pencil because I didn't have a handheld, and I just kept it that way. Um, and they shoot uh, three or four different fucking interviews, right? Plus, we've talked about it in between. So let's say you know twenty to thirty minutes. And as they were doing the last one, Oli's talking, and all of a sudden he looks off camera. This is one we didn't use. He said, ah, here we go. And I look, and there's Bischoff in his red Corvette pulling into the parking lot. So, I mean, he must have used the express elevator at CNN Center. And uh, so I said, well, do you need to go? He said, oh, hold on. So Bischoff walks up to get within about 10 feet of us. He sees me there with the camera. I'm beaming. Holy, can I see you a minute? I said, Eric, I'm on lunch. I'm doing an interview with my kid. Hold on. I'll be right, <laughs> I'll be right there. So he finished the fucking, the last one we got to do, right? And he says, all right, I'm going to go in here. Go in and get fired. Because he was, he, I think this was maybe, maybe part of his plot. He knew he didn't want to be there anymore. He's taking the money, but God damn it, he wasn't going to fucking get mad if, if Bischoff fired him because he didn't like fucking Bischoff. And it was, it was only, right? So, God damn, they go in the power plant. And I'm standing there talking to Bryant, and that's what I've told the story before. I saw Bischoff's spotless red Corvette, and I picked a big old greasy green booger and wiped it across his windshield just so he'd have something to look at on the way back. And they're in there 10 minutes or whatever, not long, and I said, Bischoff comes out and gets his car, drives off, not says anything, only walks back up. Well, what happened? He said, well, we walked in there. I said, all right, Eric, everybody wants to know. 
Everybody wants to see you and me. What's going to happen? Everybody wants to know. What do you got to say to me? Like you're daring him to fire him. <laughs> and he said, he said, only said that Bischoff said, well, we think you're using very poor judgment in sp speaking to Jim Cornette. And Ole said, well, I'm just speaking to him because he's going to give my kid a job. You know, my kid, Bryant, my son, the one that you fucking cut or fired or, you know, forgot about or whatever terminology you used. And he says, so he's going to, he's going to be wrestling for him. We're out there in the parking lot uh, on my own time. I'm at lunch, whatever. Just get it over with motherfucker. And he said, Bishop just, well, blah, blah, blah. and he changed some subject and he said something about something else. And then he said, well, well, we'll talk about this further and got back in the fucking car and took off. And then the next day called him on the phone and fired him. Maybe it was two days later. It was imminent. So we could, when Bischoff was downtown and Ole was out in fucking Peachtree City or wherever, he called him. So, well, Ole, I was, we're giving you your notice. Well, what took you so long was the the uh, comeback that I heard from Ole because <laughs> then, then Ole ended up coming up and doing, I think, two of my live TV tapings, at least the first one, maybe the, the first two that Bryant was on. Well, <sighs> Ole Anderson, certainly one of the most unique characters in wrestling history, one of the most influential characters for a generation behind the yeah. scenes. And I guess just to settle it and end it with this, should he be in a wrestling hall of fame? I don't see how he can not be. I mean, uh, I, again, if there's a, if there's a wrestling hall of fame and you've got a cap of 20 wrestlers from all history, then maybe not. But if it's a wrestling hall of fame open to anyone who's hall of fame level, I don't see how anybody, again, he was making money and featured in main events as a wrestler and a booker that dwarfed some of the biggest stars that are currently in the Hall of Fame that were just territory wrestlers. And he achieved something that few people in the territory days were able to accomplish, really ownership of part or all or some of a territory uh, while at the same time doing something else, doing it by doing something else that almost nobody was able to do, which is make one move after you break into business, make one move and pretty much are able to work that part of the country for the rest of your career and retire off of it. So there's, there's multiple unique or very rare milestones that only Andrew and to be not only a main event wrestler that drew money with the, their matches with Flair and Valentine were what put Flair and Valentine in the Carolinas on the map uh, in a heel-heel program. Uh, not only to be great in the ring, but to be even better on the microphone and to do all this stuff behind the scenes and to have given either their first job or the okay to begin training uh, of them or their first national exposure or their first main event spots to everybody from the road warriors to Rick rude fucking on and on. Um, you know, how can he not be? I don't e I don't even understand the, the discussion here. We're, we're, t we're talking about putting Kenny Olivier in the fucking Hall of Fame and, and Ole Anderson somehow has to clear a bar as he told the other guy. Perhaps you just don't understand what success looks like in this fucking business. Well, there <sighs> it is, our look at the life and career of Ole Anderson. And I guess to sum it all up, as Ole would say, go fuck yourself. Go fuck yourself. Well, Jim, before we move completely on from the uh, sad news of passings and wrestling and another wrestling death this past week, Someone you weren't around too much, if ever, but Virgil. Some, yes. Virgil, who most famously was the bodyguard for Ted DiBiase, then had a babyface run after that. They later brought him into the NWO and WCW as Vincent. And then they changed his name to Shane. He was also Curly Bill and Soul Man Jones, I think. And No, no, Soul Train Soul Jones. Soul Train Jones. Soul Train Jones, that's right. But Virgil just passed away. Any thoughts on this? Certainly a memorable character from uh, the height of WWF. Do you know who first told me about... Well, his name was Mike Jones. So I, I, do you know who first told me about Mike Jones? Based on where he was working, my guess is going to be Randy Hales. Brian Hildebrand. Oh, really? 
Brian Hildebrandt, Mark Curtis, for those of you 90s WCW referee fans, because he was from Pittsburgh. And that was the period of time, what was it, 86, 87, where several of the guys from the Pittsburgh, the West Virginia independent scene that was kind of rudimentary at the time, uh, got booked in Memphis. There was uh, uh, Virgil uh, became Soul Train Jones, and they dressed him up in the red, white, and blue striped Apollo Creed uh, gimmick from Rocky. And he was a baby face. And then a guy named Goliath, who was, I, I don't remember what his real name was, but he was like almost seven feet tall and long hair. He, uh, Goliath got a spot. And also downtown Bruno. Bruno Lauer, because Bruno had been working as an indie manager also up in that area, and he was Brian Hildebrand's nemesis, right? Brian was always wanting to, you know, to get in a territory, and Bruno beat him to it and got into Memphis. Because Bruno could do a bit better promo than Brian Hildebrand. Brian was a better worker, but he was too small. Nevertheless, he said, yeah, Soul Train, they're calling him Soul Train Jones, and he's doing an Apollo Creed gimmick in Memphis. And, of course, then I got the tapes from, you know, most of the territories on a monthly basis. And so I saw him and noticed noticed him more because Brian had talked about him. But, you know, you could tell he, he, was, he was green and he was a good athlete, but that was a, a period of time in Memphis where not too much was going to get over, but he did a good job with it and was there probably longer than those other guys. And then that's finally, then after that is when he got the... Uh, the spot as Virgil, which as you know, everybody has since known it wasn't a common knowledge then to the average fan going to the shows, but they were trying to fuck with Dusty. Dusty was the booker for the opposition. So we're going to make the, the stooge, the servant, the butler, we're going to give him, you know, your real name. And so then when, <laughs> when the shoe was on the other foot and he went to work for WCW, uh, in what, 99 or whatever it was uh, for the NWO, it was, uh, they named him Vincent after Vince McMahon because he was the NWO's flunky guy. He really was the perfect guy in the role of Ted DiBiase's bodyguard. Because, I mean, anyone could have been slotted in there, but he portrayed it the right way. He never talked. He always gave you like a stern look. He always got his ass kicked. But he still came back and you thought he may be tough because he was a big jacked up guy. Yeah. But he was perfect in that role. And they 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 worked it, you know, when they were out in public too, traveling together. He would open the doors and carry the bags. And well, that's the thing is some people were saying, you know, on the internet after he passed away is that he would do whatever. You know, when he showed up at a show, what you want me to do, whatever you want me to do, as long as I get paid, right? And the you know, getting paid was a part of most of his modern era or latter day fame in the links that he would go to to sell his gimmicks or merchandise or selfies. Or if somebody, you know, on the bus asked him for a picture, he'd charge him for it, whatever. But uh, but he uh, committed. He would always give 100 percent to whatever he was doing. And he didn't mind, you know, having people see him carrying Ted DiBiase's bags in the at the hotel because it. It made the gimmick. It made the gimmick and it worked and they were together for a few years and then they finally built him up with Roddy Piper behind him to turn babyface, to have enough of Ted DiBiase's sudden abusiveness. He was never really <laughs> abusive to Virgil and then all of a sudden he became a real jerk. Yeah. <laughs> and then Virgil uh, turned babyface and won the million dollar belt and it's easy to forget now and he certainly became a comedy figure later in life, but on purpose, uh, yeah. on social media and stuff. But for a brief moment there, it worked and they got him over and he was really over as a, you know, upper mid card baby face holding a WWE million dollar belt title. And, uh, you know, uh, that's why I was going to say I was briefly around him because as I do recall, I sound like, you know, the guy, the voiceover guy on fucking Iron Chef, as I recall. Uh, he was there when we first started making shots in 93. Virgil was still there or had maybe he'd left before, but he was there. 
No, he finished up. I think know. the last night was uh, Royal Rumble '94, the beginning of '94. Okay. So he was there. So, yeah, so he, you know, he was there, and I mean, you know, once a month we'd go up for TV. I never sat down and had any in-depth conversations with him, but he seemed like a, you know, halfway normal, rational person for this business. Admittedly, the bar is low, but then. <laughs> I really, you know, have never spent any time around him since then. Maybe we were, you know, at the same convention at some point or whatever. But then it, in recent years, I would hear the the tweets about the Olive Garden meat sauce or, <laughs> you know, whatever. It, I mean, and, you we, know. We had a also, series of videos where you and him or you and whoever runs his social media were in a very funny fashion going back and forth. Well, that's what I'm trying. I don't even remember the details now, to be honest with you about that. You reminded me of it earlier, but that's what I was going to ask you was, was this a case where I hate to speak ill of anybody, but was it like the Iron Sheik where for a while there, maybe he wasn't, you know, all right. And people were taking advantage of it. Or was it just, did he just decide to become a wacky person in his, you know, latter years and for the social media thing? and? Yeah, I don't even, like I said, I find it hard to believe anybody my age sitting there tweeting wacky things to the kids out there or, you know, texting or whatever. But I do know that some of the guys have people that run their social media so they can, don't have to fuck with it. And they say outlandish things. But what do we know? Was Virgil serious with all this? Do we know yet to this day? Or was he, was he pulling all of our puds, as they say? I don't know uh, what he pulled, but it was certainly a social media team, and it was a concerted campaign. Bizarre at times. I'm not exactly sure where they were going, but it got people talking about it. I just read something. It may have been Greg Oliver's column in Slam. I don't know. I don't remember off the top of my head. And I was blown away by this. It said after wrestling, he went back and got a degree in mathematics. What? Yeah, I was like, what? <laughs> Where did that come from? I never heard that. Well, uh, well, no, what, what, he was always good with his money. No wonder he could count so well. <laughs> he wanted to make sure he got he got to turn a profit on those selfies or whatever. But no, we he hate learned to a lot about that. counting with Ted DiBiase's money in his hands. Oh, well, there, you, there you go. Um, but no, we hate to hear that. No, never any personal issues or anything with Virgil and and. You know, we wish his family and friends and, and who got custody of the Soul Train Jones outfit? I might be interested. Or the meat sauce. We need to find out more uh, details. But, you know, they never got to actually market his own brand of meat sauce. Is that what they were going for? Well, I think the problem was the uh, the holdup was WWE owning the rights to the name Virgil. Because without so, the name, what are you? Just Mike Jones's sauce probably wasn't going to. Hey, would you like to get some of Mike Jones's sauce? Where? Well, right over here at the store. Well, of course, uh, like you said, we send our uh, thoughts to the friends and family and fans of Virgil. And of course, and, Vir oh, and fans ahead. of all meat sauces around the world. And the Olive Garden. But Jim Virgil started out, like you said, Soul Train Jones. And Soul Train had a lot of really great music. And you could listen to lots of great music with Raycon. Oh, good Lord. So, uh, what a cold tag. You that was, know, here's that was lukewarm. the thing. That was lukewarm. Well, well, here's the thing. Lonely Virgil became a meme. A pictures of Virgil sitting at his merchandise table with nobody there, nobody coming up and spending any money. A lonely Virgil. But you know why he wasn't lonely? You know why he didn't give a shit? You know why he was just sitting there, just minding his own business? Because the whole time he was grooving to the tunes that were invisible to the naked eye and uh, unaudible to the naked ear because he had them going on his Raycon wireless earbuds. That's now right. you can see it in a different light, can't you? I say, can't you? I can, I can, yes. You can, well, yeah. Well, a whole different light because he's sitting there enjoying the soundtrack to his life without any any uh, uh, distractions or aggravations or frustrations or worries from people coming up and handing him money. And let's face it, folks, most of you out there listening right now, nobody tomorrow is going to come up and just hand you money to be able to take their, your picture because you're nobody and nobody cares for you. 
So drown your sorrows by listening to good music. Nobody's nobody. Everybody's somebody. Well, everybody loves somebody sometime. But you can't please all of the people all of the time, but you can fool some of the people some of the time unless you're a nobody, in which case nobody's going to pay you to take your picture. So if, if, if I'm mistaken, if somebody is out there listening, then I'm not talking about you somebodies. I'm only talking to you nobodies. If you're somebody that somebody is going to come up to tomorrow and pay to be able to take your picture, then this does not apply to you. But if you're one of these regular garden variety schlubs where they, you can walk up and down a street all day, you can get on the bus, you can get on a subway, you can get on a plane, you can get on a train, you can get on a car, you can get on a tractor, you can get on a bicycle, a motorcycle, a tricycle, you can get on a hover around, you can go up and down every main street in town. Nobody's going to stop you and say, I'll give you 10 bucks, let me take your picture. I'm talking to you. Because you need something to take your mind off your troubles, folks. Yeah. And that would be the Raycon wireless earbuds. You take these little jet dads with these gel tips that makes the lubrication easy, and they're going to pop right in your fucking ears, and they ain't going to come out. You can shake your head. You can turn cartwheels, handspring elbows. Folks, they will not fall out. They will not be jarred from your skull by earthquakes, tornadoes, or potentially hazardous conditions related to chemical materials. They're in there, and you can listen to anything you want with eight hours of playtime and a 32-hour battery life. After that, well, things get iffy, and you might have to plug your ass back into the wall. Three customizable sound profiles with earbud tap functions, including noise isolation and the awareness mode, so you can both isolate yourself from noise and at the same time be aware of any modes that are going on in your area. And you can sign off on anything related to the Raycons, knowing that they're not only of the highest quality, but also they cost half the price of the other premium audio brands. And you know why? Because there's some things involved in the supply chain with Raycon that are falling off the truck. That's why what? they could give you these incredible no, deals because that's not why. And that is not why that I they can give you these incredible deals for legitimate reasons, not truck emptying reasons, falling, falling off the truck, falling. And, well, it's an empty truck. Once everything well, falls out. Well, no, no, the truck starts out full, but then it gets there. Well, there's a few things that have fallen off and that's why I'm not going to give any details, but the government is not involved in these transactions. That's how yes. they can pass the savings on to the consumer. Nor is the truth. Eight hours of playtime and a 32 hour battery life. Just think about that. <laughs> you just think about it. Just think about it. Okay. But anyway, so half the price of the other premium brands because of all these things that we mentioned and so many more involving you know, the rights to certain syndicates and docs and enforcers and things of that nature. These products None can of get nature. to you. No, but well, yes, they can get to you. They, these products can get to you through a variety, a, circu a circuitous route involving uh, lacks of customs and, you know, under under uh, sea vessels that sometimes transport things across the international date line. But nevertheless, you're not going to pay as much money as you would if you just went to a store and took no risk of being arrested. So, right now, if you go to buyraycon.com, B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N.com slash J-C-E, not only are you going to pay half the price of these premium legal brands, but also you're going to get 20% off the gimmick price that they give you because somebody in the, along the chain of command is getting shafted. So no. that's like 20% off, 50% off. They're giving you a good deal because they care about their customers. Not everything is nefarious. Not everything involves some weird dock and people falling off trucks and whatever's happening in your world. And the international date line. Don't forget about that. It has nothing to do with Interpol. Well, it's seven miles offshore. You don't have to pay certain fees. But folks, once again, you're going to save a bunch of money regardless of who you harm in the, you know, the overall scheme of things. You're not harming anyone. What are you talking about? There's no well, harm, no foul. A lot of these customs officials, you know, they might not be getting their bribes if you do it this way because we're keeping it under the table. 
Anyway, right now, again, if you go to buyraycon.com slash JCE, you're going to get 20% off the pittance, the measly mere bag of shells that they charge for these fine earbuds, and you're also going to get free shipping. So you don't have to pay for the postage to send this stuff to your lazy ass. You're going to get 20% off an already horribly, deeply discounted price. And you're going to get fine quality earbuds with all kinds of buttons on them that you can use to make different noises. And then with your super hearing, Brian, do you need earbuds? Or when you walk down the street, can you just listen to other people's earbuds here inside their heads? I can usually hear if someone's next to me with earbuds, I can hear what's going on. I have super hearing. I can hear all sorts of things. Yeah, well, that's why I mentioned the super hearing. So you don't need, but if you don't, you don't need earbuds, but if you don't have super hearing and you can't listen to other people's earbuds, you need earbuds. Earbuds don't help you them. listen to someone else's earbuds. Earbuds help you listen to the sounds you want to hear in your no. ears. That's what I'm saying. If you can't hear other people's earbuds, you need a set of your own because then you, if you don't have your own, you won't be able to hear anything. I could hear that silence. Well, there, I'm just waiting for you to agree with me. What I said was perfectly logical right there. Go to buyraycon.com slash JCE today. 20% off your Raycon order and free shipping. You'll never believe how inexpensive it is for you to hear Music and voices inside your head. That's right. Raycon by Raycon.com. What is that promo code one more time, Jim? JCE. JCE. And Jim, this really is going to be a historical show today in terms of the topics we're going to discuss. This next one involves you. This was a big week. Jim Cornette was on TV on two different channels within a few days. On me TV with Sven Gulli. Oh. And then on A&E. The Randy Orton biography. Well, I see the the segue that you segued there. Because I thought this was going to be like the anniversary of when I was on TV 30 years ago or whatever. No, you were uh, literally on two different channels in three days or whatever. Well, yes, because I'm, I'm an international celebrity. These things happen with regularity when, the, you know, the magnitude of me, Brian. I've talked to you about this before. Well, we saw some of that magnitude in A&E's biography of Randy Orton. What did you think? Um, you know what? I I loved this one. Not even for, well, I'm not going to say not even, not, but not even for the, usually I love the old footage and then it's up to whoever does the biography or whoever the subject is as to whether the show is any good. But with this one, Randy seems like he's so smoothed out and realized what the fuck and he's got a, the wife and kids and you know he's come back from a back injury he's, as i said before in the elimination chamber he was the smartest guy in the match he got the most out of the least and didn't hurt himself and and stole the show blah 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 so it's nice to see that this has a happy ending rather than you know Everybody either a hit piece like they did on fucking Savage or everybody having a miserable story that ends in leprosy and death or whatever. When they show the outside of the old OVW building, I thought, oh, this is going to really get a, a dark story here. <laughs> it's like the slums of uh, Steam Pipe Alley. I don't know what's well, going now, on. Well, now everybody can, can put, you know, a visual picture to what I've been describing all that time. It was literally a an old, you know, late 1800s set of brick buildings that had been completely emptied out except for Danny Davis found a place he could get a ring in and do TV and run a school out of, and, and it, the, it cost $700 a fucking month, the rent on that bill. is $700 a month was the rent on the first building that was uh, WWE developmental headquarters that trained Brock Lesnar, John Cena, Shelton Benjamin, Randy Orton, Batista, et cetera, et cetera. So you, now you know what it looked like. But uh, again, this was a two-hour biography. They, they tailed off at the end of last season doing some people for just an hour. But um, uh, with the, they're back to the two hours. And did you notice the disclaimer at the head of the program? I did. That's a new one. 
Well, you'd, I, and then I, as soon as you watch the first 15 minutes, you realize why. It was the views of Randy Orton are not necessarily those of the WWE or, you know, who, or any, anybody related to us, right? Because he knocked the fucking Marines. He told the truth about what was the deal with him and the Marines, and apparently that's controversial in this environment. But there was nothing else on the, the program that was in any way he was speaking in a positive, uplifting manner to people about don't do what I did in terms of immaturity or attitude issues or, or substance issues. There was nothing in all the rest of the program that was controversial but him telling the truth about why he's in fuck the fucking Marines. They conned him into the goddamn deal, and then what he saw there would get people in a civilian setting arrested, and he didn't want to be involved with it. So I, that's, but... That was the first time I, I heard the full story from him. Well, and you know, that's the thing is now it's, that's why I thought the overall tone of the program was great because he's not being the, the, uh, the attitude issue, the out of control, the fucking, you know, egomaniac or all of the other things that they talked about in this show that he was 20 years ago or when he couldn't handle it, when he was immature or whatever, he's not being that now, nor has he been that for a while so now he has credibility when he can come back and say you know what i was a fuck up but all this shit everything in my life wasn't my fault here's what these other motherfuckers did it's got more credibility right if he'd have been saying that when he was a 25 year old attitude problem plus fuck these marines well then everybody got bullshit right so it's it's nice that he's able to look back on that now and like i said have happy family life all the money i'm pretty sure he's gonna fucking need kids blah 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 and he can still call bullshit on bullshit but he knows now that his bullshit sometimes is bullshit had you heard the marine story back in the ovw days when you first brought him in or when he first came in well first we heard that he was um that he had just gone awol and got in trouble and that wouldn't be anything unusual for you know anybody in a wrestling family or whatever but then w without going into that much granular detail you know we did hear that it w it wasn't like what you think that he didn't just goddamn take off because he didn't like it or whatever the fuck and there were other issues at play and everything was resolved it wasn't like he served years in prison or was they didn't break his sword and fucking rip his buttons off and kick him out of the fort. So, but, uh, you know, but at the same time, he wasn't, that was right when it was fresh. It wasn't like he was going and telling everybody that he came up to what the whole detail was, because also at that point, who would kind of believe him, you know? So, nevertheless, it didn't sound like a pleasant experience, but, that was, you know, here's the thing I was going to say is he was 18 years old, 19 years old during the period of time that was going on. That was the late nineties. He talked about, you know, obviously Bob Orton Jr. being his father and him seeing, you know, he mentioned the territories and is, you know, going to locker rooms when he was a kid. But when you think about it, by the time he was cognizant of anything, Bob was in the WWF, and, you know, that's why the pictures of him with Andre and et cetera, but he didn't really have a lot of memory of Bob Orton Jr. as the big star that he was in the territories, in Florida, in Georgia, in the Carolinas, and. I think Randy, we figured out, was born when Bob was in Southeastern in Knoxville. No, actually, I think he was born after the split. Oh, maybe he was born in Lexington. I think he was born in Knoxville, but I think it was after the ICW. Okay, uh, okay. Southeastern well, yes, but, but I remember when he was here, we worked out that he had been born in Knoxville because I think he ended up probably going to make it a couple of those Ron Fuller shows. But to, the point is, with with him being born in, what, 79 or 80, whatever year it was, 
he had missed a lot of Bob's territory days that uh, because Bob Orton Jr. being the son of Bob Orton Sr., obviously, the big O, Zodiac, etc. You know, Bob Jr. had started early and he was a prodigy and he had gotten over fairly quickly in Florida. So he was he wasn't like ancient when Randy was born, but at the same time, by the time Randy was born, Bob had been a bigger star in the territories. And that's why the Randy mentioned later on when guys would come up to his dad and say, Oh, wow. I'm a big fan of yours. This and that. It would make Randy go like, Oh, that's cool. They're putting my dad over instead of me. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's the thing is that, um, by the time that Randy was what, Nine, ten. Bob's major league career was over after the. Did he do anything? And everybody did something in early WCW in the early nineties. Bob Orton Jr. I know he worked for me in Smoky Mountain on the Legend Show. He was still doing indies and stuff, but for whatever reason, that match stole did... the show at the Legend Show. Yeah, the Bob Orton Jr. and Dick Slater against Ronnie Garvin and the Mongolian Stomper was the best worked match on the fucking show. Now, uh, he, he um he finished up with WWE by the end of 87, early 88, I think. And then in 89, he went to WCW. Remember, I think he had a few to like Dick Murdoch. It was just all of a sudden he was there and then he wasn't. That's right. I was there for a while. That's when George Scott, when everybody was coming in for a cup of coffee. But then he went to eventually, I think he did some stuff for like Herb Abrams. And, you know, he was billed when I was like 10 years old. All of a sudden they announced him on TV in New York as being on the next garden show. And he wasn't. So maybe there were plans to bring him back at one point. I don't know. But I'll never forget that. They said, and making his return, Cowboy Bob Orton. It was on for a few weeks. And then he wasn't on the show. And he was never referenced ever again. And it was only on local New York TV for at least a garden show. But after that. I think maybe he worked for like Alperstein's AWF, but he never went yeah. back to WCW. He never went back to the WWF. He, you know, was an indie guy who could really still work. He may have been yeah. better after that point. I mean, again, that's showing not. Well, he, he was only 40. Yeah. See, it's at the, in 1990, I mean, give or take a couple of years, I don't have his birth certificate in front of me, but he would have only been about 40 years old. And that's why it, it, with the territories going away, his career ended on a major stage somewhat prematurely. And, you know, when he came in, when Randy was here, Bob came in for OVW and did a show at the gardens and was in the corner and looked fucking great. And his, his shit was always impeccable in the ring. So anyway, but we saw some, you know, highlights of Bob Orton Jr. And even a couple clips of Orton Sr. And then great home movies. That's one thing about, the modern era guys getting biographies. There's, there's no fucking, you know, home movies of when Jim Londos was a kid. Right. But and now everybody had a video camera. And it, again, you know, it, it's, um, there was pictures of Randy who wrestled in high school. Cause you know, he's a big, tall kid and his father's a wrestler. So that's not a stretch, but he didn't really, he didn't aspire to be a pro. Didn't really think he could do it. Didn't, have that as a goal in life all, you know, you know, through his childhood. And, you know, and we knew that he'd had a little amateur wrestling background when he got here at OVW, but he was by no means a standout, you know, amateur athlete, but he basically didn't know what he wanted to do. So he joined the Marines in exchange for the recruiter bought him some beer and told him and some of his buddies, they'd get a bunch of fucking girls. And, and that, that's, I could see that happening. And, you know, he's, he loved the boot camp and excelled at that because it was, you know, he liked athleticism, physical training, whatever. But then when he went to the main roster, so to speak, and saw the other guys fucking with the new recruits and electrocuting them or whatever the fuck, he's like, fuck that. And he got on a bus with they. I loved it. He he basically went to him and said, hey, I didn't sign up for this. I don't like this shit. I don't want to be a part of it. Instead of saying, oh, we'll, we'll check into this horrible behavior, they just said, no, you can't go anywhere. He said, fuck you. He got on a bus and went back to St. Louis. And then he goes back and turns himself in and says, I want out. And they said, no. 
<laughs> so he goddamn said, well, I ain't going to do anything then. So they put him in the brig for 38 days or whatever and then discharged him. But you got to admire the balls. He went back. He said, look, I just I don't I don't like this shit that is going on. And I didn't sign up to be a part of this. Let me out of here. No. Well, fuck you. I'll go home. He was born for the wrestling business. That happened in the movie The Wanderers. All the baldies go into the recruiting station. The guy's always there. They don't know why he's always watching them. They go in there. He gets them drunk. He gets them all to sign their life away. And before they realize it, it's over. And it sounds like Randy Orton had a very similar situation where the guy, again, if you're feeding minors alcohol to get them to sign into the military, that's pretty fucked up. Well, besides, oh, the girls love you. They love the man in uniform. Yeah, you'll be beating him off with a stick. Uh, but besides that, again, you know, it, that is a lesson. If you ever are in a situation where people are saying, well, you fucking, you got to do this. No, you don't have to do any fucking thing. You can just sit there and fold your fucking arms. What are they going to, they might throw you in jail, but sooner or later, they got to let you out. That's one of the best lessons I learned from you, actually, many, many, many years ago. You could always just say, I'm going home. Yeah, <laughs> that's another option right there. How about this? I'll just go fucking home. But anyway, but then he didn't know what the fuck to do. So he started kind of watching wrestling again, asked his dad. And so his dad calls the office and talked to Bruce and said, I got I got my son. I can't do his voice. And they gave him a tryout in St. Louis and, you know, got him a contract. And <laughs> Randy said, and I'm, it, both of these things may be true. He said, well, they gave me 250 bucks a week. That may have been just while he was living in St. Louis. When he finally came to OVW, I remember he was getting 750 Because most of the guys started out at five, but yeah, I think he had a family member bonus i wondered about that because they referenced both numbers at different points him on commentary when you heard that tape of him in ovw and then of course him talking about 250 yeah well uh, that's the thing is it may have been that they were giving him some money just to be able to live at home and go to the gym or whatever and then they upped it when he came here but generally most of the guys were 500 although the Contracts to the guys that we really had faith and confidence in. At first, Nick Dinsmore, Rob Conway, Basham, Damage, and a couple of other guys. We said, how can you not give these guys contracts when they're actually in the ring teaching the fucking green schlubs that can't work that you've sent down here? They begrudge it. Bruce begrudgingly gave them 300 bucks a week at first. And then we got JR to up it. But nevertheless, point is, it wasn't retirement money but it was so you could pay your bills and go to wrestling school. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's when the, the old Davis arena shots of the old warehouse in Jeffersonville, it came into the picture there. And the comments from me, by the way, were from 2017. Cause I already had some people on Twitter. Did they come down at, no, this was when I did the hall of fame shoot. We talked about everybody. But Randy, when he got here, he was very young, and he I think he'd had five matches in St. Louis for, what was it, the South Broadway Athletic Club? That's where Harry White used to do stuff, right? He's yes. the commissioner. Commissioner Harry, Harry White. Harry White was the local commissioner, and they had indie matches at a small gym in St. Louis, and I think Randy had had like five matches there, but for the most part, you know, we were starting from scratch. He could sell better than his offense because he wasn't an outgoing kid at that point. He wasn't, like like we said, he had said, I didn't think I could do the wrestling thing. So he wasn't like jumping in the ring going, I'm Bob Orton Jr.'s son, I'll be the greatest. He didn't have his head up straight. His offense was weak. But he could sell because, you know, he knew how to get the shit kicked out of him. And his body was, yeah. Because he was a kid, and he'd never been a dedicated bodybuilder. He was in fine shape for an average 19, 20-year-old on the street, but not for a pro wrestler. Yeah, well, actually, when we first showed up, he was he had a little muffin top to him. He had a little muffin top tailorish first couple months. But the point I was going to make was that he changed all that fairly quickly. Because at first, he wasn't really dedicated or motivated, but then... The talking to after I just, I just want to make my money. I just want to get paid. I hate wrestling. They didn't put that part on there. 
Um, I was going to ask you about that because you've always referenced that tape or you've mentioned it to me. Was that the whole tape or how much more audio of Randy well, was there? B- beforehand, the way, and I've got to, I got to dig it up. I have a VHS copy, but before that comment, the way that I remembered it was, I don't want to say he said, I hate wrestling. It was something to the effect of the guys were talking and the mic was open. And one of the guys said something about wrestling or other. Randy was like, I don't care about wrestling. I just want to get paid. Um, that type of attitude, which he had, but once that, you know, he started getting talked to at that point, you could see in the footage that they put in the, in this biography, uh, you could kind of tell what was earlier and what was later based on the change in his body. Not only the changes in his hairstyle, he, Fucked around with that for a while. When he first got here, he looked like a Marine because he just got out of the fucking Marines. <laughs> and he had almost bald. And then he's got some hair. And then he's almost got long hair. And then he he, he was fucking with his, his tights and his look. and and But at the same time, he was working out hard. And you can see the change in his body and his physique. And he got a tan instead of showing up like he'd been you know, sleeping in his mom's basement. He was so pale. He was translucent. He looked, but he, even though he was still only aging chronologically, like a year and a half or two years while he was here, he looked five or six or seven years older when he left than when he got here because he'd gotten bigger and tanner and better looking and, you know, and also more polished it at one of the spots they saw. It was, he was working with smooth Johnny Spade and it was a leapfrog and Randy was trying to hit the ropes and he almost tripped and fell down. And by the next year, there was a clip of him. I think it was in a gardens match where he's doing these wheelbarrow fucking suplexes and goddamn beautiful standing drop kicks. And he, once he dedicated himself to learning it and doing it, he got really good at it real quick. When you hear about the attitude problems, and certainly whatever there were in OVW are different than what they were later on when he just became very rich and successful and he was on national TV, they talked about it in the documentary, but with the attitude issues in OVW, how did he interact and get along with specifically you and Danny Davis, but then the really, the big group of guys that were there with him that everyone always talks about, Batista, Cena, and Lesnar. How did he get along with those guys? Uh, Well, there wasn't, see, here's the thing. His attitude problem, and this kind of makes sense when you think about it, his attitude problem when he came to uh, to OVW was just that this had never been his dream. He didn't know what he was going to do with his life. He just got out of this fucking Marine deal, and now he's getting a check, and he's it's better than nothing, and he didn't really have any emotional investment in it. So he just, you know, is something to do. But it's not like he was a raging prick egomaniac the the opposite he didn't really think at first that he could do this well certainly not to the maybe the level that his dad did so he wasn't like being a a, a, an obnoxious egotistical person as an individual he didn't have a good attitude toward his training and his what he was being asked to do for his job but once that enough people said no you can actually be good at this and convinced him that he was fine in the locker room as one of the boys, he didn't cause trouble. But then he gets suddenly to the WWE, and now it's instead of, boy, you look really good, Randy, down here in wrestling school, and you've really done a great job, pat on the back. Now it's, you're going to be the world champion of the biggest promotion in the world. Now he goes the other way from, I didn't think I could do this at all, to I'm the greatest goddamn thing in the world. It kind of makes sense, doesn't it? In the space of three to four years, all this happens. That you would bounce from one extreme to the other. Maybe the second extreme was caused by the first extreme. I'm not saying everyone would go full tilt like Randy did. I mean, he talked about his issues with substance abuse and just the way he treated fans and whoever, everyone it seemed like. But from your experience, are there a lot of guys that age that can go from OVW or a training program to getting that spot and that success that quickly and handle it well? Is that a common thing or is that a rare thing? Well, it's a rare thing to be able to handle everything well, you know, but it's exceptionally hard to have, when you think about it, 
Batista was 30, right? He'd been a grown adult man for a while. Cena has always been unnaturally mature, right? And focused and dedicated. I'm going to be a big star, make a lot of money, achieve my goals, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, um, of all of the people that Brock, you know, Brock had, he was Who kind of his own. a attitude problem in OVW in your eyes? Brock Lesnar or Randy Orton? Um, Brock Lesnar, because he didn't want to be there at all. <laughs> he didn't want to be there in that training program. He wouldn't be back in Minnesota with his cows. Right? But at the same time, he, he's a... <laughs> his sawmill, a, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, he's a world-class athlete, and he can do all the shit great, but, you know, just he didn't have a lot of personality. Randy, at least, was... He was a kid, you know, but he was excelling and improving and getting with the program, whereas... And, and he didn't ask out early, right? But it's different attitudes for different things. So the point being is that's an awful, sharp boomerang from... You're an 18-year-old kid that's just fucking parted on bad terms with the Marines and don't know what the fuck you're going to do. You were the son of a superstar in and the grandson of a superstar in wrestling, but now you're starting and look at you compared to all these other motherfuckers. And three years later, he's the goddamn chosen one to be the WWE champion. That's, yeah, that's a recipe for disaster. Can you imagine if it had... Can you imagine Buddy Landell in that position? If you already had Buddy's personality and gave him that. My God, I can't even imagine. You know, with the exception of like a Luthez, there are very few guys that at a young age got those kind of opportunities and handled it pretty well. And Fez had his dad there and then Strangler Lewis. Yeah. But, you know, the Von Erichs, Tommy Rich, various people. There aren't so too many. There aren't too many. No. So anyway, and then there was much more money on the line. We were talking about, you know, in the territory days, a couple hundred thousand dollars was the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and now it's a, it would have been a couple of million at the point where Randy was at. So it is fucking crazy. But nevertheless, he's called up, and he debuts, and then I remember this well, because I was still keeping an eye on our recent alumni. He fucks up his shoulder almost as soon as he's debuted, and... They showed the surgery footage, which I looked away from because I can't stand that shit. But it helped in that while he was away, they made him a heel based on his cheesy, you know, injury updates. And I know you're all waiting to, for me to come back. I'm 32% cleared or whatever. But at least they kept him alive and he joined Evolution. And that started his evolution to the legend killer and coming up with the RKO and a blah, blah, blah. But that also was, again, major injury that I'm sure he rushed back from at a young age at that point in time to not lose his push. That starts the painkiller thing that gets worse. And, I mean, they didn't even go into the number of times that his shoulders have been a problem, but you remember... God, was it, well, maybe it was 10 or 12 years ago now. He was doing a thing where he used to do where he'd ramp up to strike with the RKO or whatever, punching the fucking mat, and he punched the mat and blew his own shoulder out. Do you remember that, or was that when we weren't paying attention? I don't remember that. I mean, when they said it in this, I was like, oh, that's how he got hurt? I mean, it stuck out because it was such a, you know, freak way to get hurt. Yeah, because it, once you do that, you know, it can happen to get so... You know that, and, and you can say, and then he would flip in the ring. He'd either cuss his opponents out, or he cussed himself out from that when he he was fucking cussing himself because he hurt himself. And he's just fucking Tourettesing in the ring. That's he had problems dealing with his anger. That's when they finally got him to go to, you know, rehab after he'd gotten the big head. He wins the title. He won the the title at SummerSlam 2004. That was less than four years after he had showed up at OVW to start training. But Mark Henry said, the quote was, he became a monster, and Batista was kinder. He was a kid. And Cody said he a complete lack of filter. And, you know, even Orton said, I let the fans get, or the fame get to my head, rather, and thought that my shit didn't stink. 
And so by 2005, not only has he got that reputation going for himself, but also he's taken hundreds of pills, uh, you know, at a time or getting hundreds of pills at a time in his prescriptions. And, you know, he ain't doing himself any favors. And that, that Hall of Fame story, I remember at the time, a lot of people going, what the fuck, that was it? But I didn't know the whole story behind it. At the, but basically, uh, Randy, when he inducted his dad, he had been out all night on Friday and missed the rehearsal for his match with Taker on Saturday and then was zonked at the Hall of Fame and did a 90-second speech. And, you know, so when you've got Shawn Michaels telling you you need to straighten yourself up, that, I guess, had to at some point fucking strike a nerve somewhere what happened to him i mean i know he did a lot of things in the back to upset people like you and bret hart but what did Shawn michaels do to the gods what has happened to him you see the <laughs> state of him i don't he's gonna be your Heyman now isn't he no i mean i'm serious you look at him and he looks insane he looks crazy you would think this man's been homeless for years and he just got he, a hat he's he's very gray and very gaunt and the eyes have wandered further in different zones and yeah and he looks like well you know somebody just washed a set of clothes and gave it to that poor old man <laughs> um but back, but, it, randy orton. but back to randy orton <laughs> so uh, now we can't be laughing but he goes home after a show at orton does and accidentally overdoses based on all the things he had taken to make the drive compounded with all the things he had done to go to sleep after he got home and didn't tell the company about it, but they heard about it. You can't keep that shit quiet. And why not? How'd they hear about it? Well, he didn't say how they heard about it, but how do, how does was anybody Terry Taylor in the anything? hospital? Was Terry uh, he Taylor was, there? He was, he was probably in the waiting room <laughs> on another pregnancy scare. <laughs> um, I just, but back I to Randy Orton. But back to, Randy. back to Randy Orton. <laughs> they suspended him and got him to go to rehab. And he convinced the doctors, he worked the doctors, that he didn't have a drug problem, but they saw the anger management issues. So they did anger management counseling with him. And finally, apparently, when his first daughter was born... 2008, he said he realized that he needed to clean up, and that was when he straightened up and cha channeled his tendencies to be a maniac into the ring, into his performances, rather than his personal life. And that's when I wrote, Orton is the most honest subject yet of one of these biographies. Yeah, that's the thing, too. If anyone like, is still mad about anything he did in the past, he did a great job here of saying that he's a different person and really showing it. Yeah. That he's grown up a lot. and. I thought he was incredibly impressive here. And I mean, he said some of the worst things about himself that anybody said on the whole show. And he said the worst thing about his wife that anybody said on the whole show. They met in Poughkeepsie. That's the worst thing you can say about anybody. Oh, isn't come it? on. That's not the worst thing. Westchester <laughs> County's very nice. <laughs> well, the mid Hudson civic center locker room was a shits and the fucking toilet, uh, the bathroom always had a fucking half an inch of water on it. But anyway, they got married, and he became an even more responsible person and now has a wonderful family and kids and everything, but they met in Poughkeepsie. I bet I know oh. the diner. I bet I know the diner they went to and talked all night, though. And by the way, it's Dutchess County. It's not even Westchester County. I was wrong. Westchester's well, nice. I don't know about Dutchess. See, there you go. So you don't even know what you're talking about. So, uh, But I know the diner. I liked the diner. I mentioned the bisque. And what was the name of the diner? I can't remember the name of the diner, but it was the diner very close to the Mid-Hudson Civic Center in Poughkeepsie that was open 24 hours. Henceforth, you could go there late at night and get food. And it was very close. What'd you think of that whole story, though? I mean, it almost, I mean, I was surprised to hear her, how honest she was. She's like, yeah, I really like that guy, and I made a plan to go sit at ringside and meet him. <laughs> you rarely hear that side. Well, but it worked out for the best. It was, it was kismet. It yeah. was it was karma. They seem really happy together. It actually, does seem like it worked out for the best. 
But, uh, but anyway, then, you know, basically, you know, oh, and we found out one thing because this is the first time that I've seen Matt Riddle outside of the context of the WWE programming, the television shows, doing a sit down interview, unless he is the most committed to kayfabe in, in the current wrestling business. And I have a hard time believing that Matt Riddle does speak like a blithering simpleton. Well, we may have more about him later on in the show. We'll see how long we go. <laughs> but Holy Christ. But if so anyway, no wonder they came up with the gimmick of him annoying Randy, bro, because that's like he talks like that. What the fuck? But anyway, uh, Orton's back injuries. Doctor told him he ought to quit. He got spinal issues, but he has the surgery. He's pain free. He gets back in the ring. The rest is not yet all history, but we've seen, you know, that he's looking great and he doesn't do anything stupid, so he ought to be able to control somewhat, uh, you know, his exit strategy. And did we mention he's been doing this at a high level for 20 years and he's probably got millions of dollars in the bank? So for once, a nice little wrap-up. Well, and there it was, the first episode of the season of AEW Biography, and I have to say it was a great episode, great biography of Randy Orton. He made and it. And a I lot mean, of times. Him being the, not just the subject, but the main interview and so honest is what made this thing work. And a lot of times I'm not really interested in the ones where the guy's entire career has been spent in the WWE and there's no territory footage or, you know, whatever the case. But in this, uh, you know, it, it was a, a better story than most a, a more uplifting story than than most of the guys have about their life all the way through when they've been fuck ups at one point, and they they kept this interesting not only with the the wrestling footage but the, an equal amount of time spent personal life childhood explaining things whatever blah blah blah. Uh, overall, I'd, I I I I would give them a thumbs up, dog, on this one. All right, thumbs up, dog, for the Randy Orton biography. Jim, another show that was on biography, or well, not biography, on A&E this past week. A&E featured the first episode of the new season of WWE Rivals, seemingly taped from a session years ago, featuring people <laughs> no longer in the company, but AEW Rivals, or AEW, WWE Rivals returned with The Rock versus Triple H. Now, is it on biography and it's A&E, or is it on A&E and it's biography, or is it AEW on A&E? This so much. Or, I've got some notes here. This, I won't say this program sucked pond water, but, again, it's, the the panel adds nothing. I, I'm, I'm not knocking Freddie Prinze Jr. as a person. He may be a, an animal lover. I mean, we may get along together if we were walking our dogs in the park, but I don't know why he's here or what he adds. I also don't know, other than you reminded me, I didn't know why that Renee Moxley Good would have been invited back from her stint as a mediocre announcer in AEW to comment on something that she was probably 12 years old when it happened until you reminded me that this is the same panel they had a couple of years ago with Steen and JBL and Johnny Sameface. So apparently they... They planned this two or three years ago. How long has she been with AEW? She's been there at least a year and a half, I think. Okay, so they shot this stuff two years ago and didn't bother to come in and, and redo it. And she her, her graphic is former WWE announcer. Well, the other thing that's weird is to make this work as a series, as a concept, as a show, you don't need the panel. The panel takes away no. from the show. Yes, because there's less time to talk about the subject of the show. If you had one, and again, wh where are there legends that can, can you imagine Mick Foley hosting, hosting and being the, the voiceover guy for a Rivals program about all of these famous rivalries and feuds in pro wrestling? And he would be the, the Robert Stack on Unsolved Mysteries. He steps in out of the darkness, intros it, bridges it and closes it up and people would and I'm not just saying it just has to be Mick Foley but any wrestling legend that they have access to 
that can speak and is a pleasing television personality. The panel adds nothing because nobody gives a shit what Freddie Prince thinks about NASA either. Nobody gives a shit what I think about goddamn comedy writing. Yeah, no, um, no one needs any of these people to reinforce what we're seeing and what we already know. Like, they're not adding no. anything. And the only one old enough to have even been there is, is JBL, and he was there, but he was not involved. He was on the card. Uh, Rene Moxley, good, no. Steen, no. Same face, no, no. Um, <laughs> so I don't understand what their alleged purpose is otherwise than to prevent us from seeing more of what we're wanting to watch on the program. So the rival show, it's an hour instead of two, like the biography, it has the panel. You like the old footage, and they'll give a brief, you know, biography or background on the, the two individuals and how they came to the point that they first clashed. And, you know, they, they start at Rocky, his uh, Madison Square Garden Survivor Series debut. And I remember, obviously, that very well. And how we went from discussing his push to <laughs> discussing the backlash to his push. I was never a, a, a proponent of the haircut or the outfit. It was above my pay grade to make those decisions at that point in time. The outfit's one thing. Was there and, someone who was a proponent of the haircut? I think that was, I think that was his and they agreed to it because it was allegedly fashionable. I don't know. I don't think he was held down and make to get made to get the haircut, but he was encouraged highly to wear the streamers. But then, you know, I mean, I've I've gone on record as saying when I first saw his tryout in Corpus Christi, I said, Vince, operate under the theory that in three to five years, this guy's going to be your champion. If from the start, pick his music carefully, deal with him carefully. And... Well, you know, while while they're coming up with this fucking clown outfit for him to wear and the idea that he's going to be untouchable, and I was suggesting we ought to do stuff on TV with him with the middle card guys and let me uh, let him insult me. And by the way, this is not Jim Cornette wanting to work with The Rock because he's the goddamn biggest star in wrestling. This is Jim Cornette wanting to work with a guy that's just started on the roster because he's the son of a legend and we think he's got potential. I'm saying put him on TV. Don't have him beat the fucking main event. No, he gave me small packaging, you know, Owen Hart or whatever. Let me take the middle card, guys. If he insults me and gets on the wrong side of me, I say, well, I can make anybody a champion and anybody able to, I can train them to beat you, you know, and like Heenan used to do take guys and let, and manage them against the rock or Rocky, my V at that point. And he goes over them on television and kind of make it a little slower, right? Not so obvious, but they're like, he's going to win the survivor series match and he's going to win this and that and the other thing. Okay. Well then, the fans were like, die, Rocky, die. And Pat Patterson poured his heart into those finishes, too. But the people were getting too smart. It would have worked 20 years before, 15 years before, but the people were too smart. They knew that it was being done on purpose. What do you remember about Vince and Pat Patterson, because he was so involved in everything with The Rock, about their reaction to die, Rocky, die, and those chants? Well, it... it, it, it Pat was would react to stuff like that with bemusement with, well, yeah, because he always knew that at least it's a reaction and we'll have to make something out of it. Pat wasn't going to, you know, get violently upset or mad or stressed or whatever over anything. He was the case sera, sera guy. I did it my way. So he knew we had to do something. Vince was had more consternation, like, that's a die, Rocky. He's such a good looking kid. But when he got, you know, he got hurt, uh, I guess, as, as they've talked about, this was kind of a mini bio from other footage. The Rock talking head comments. How many years old were they in this show? He looks like a different person. Young. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but so when the fans turned on it, you know, then he had been injured and that gave him time to 
think about the things and they re redirected him and he joined the nation of domination. And then at the same time, while he was slowly taking over the nation from Ron Simmons, because we knew Rocky's potential appeal, talents, etc., just how to go about it. Well, sometimes a guy's a great baby face from the start. And sometimes a guy doesn't become a great baby face until the fans have hated him as a heel. And so that was the, the route that it was going to take. And then Triple H goes from the blue blood snob in the jewelry store. God, those things were fucking rotten. To the DX asshole. And I remember as I, I've, they were mad at me um, on the internet, you know, for I'd said some time ago, uh, no, I was shit stained and said, well, Cornette didn't think Triple H was ever going to draw any money. Well, that was incorrect. It was Hunter Hearst Helmsley that I didn't think was going to draw 15 cents in Chinese fucking money with that goddamn goofy fucking uh, riding crop and the, 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 it looked like a goddamn circus ringmaster, the tail tuxedo coat thing they had him wearing. Remember? Like he'd just come in from running the hounds and the ponytail and the snooty at it. This is fucking bullshit. Nobody's buying this. This and was this was at the period of time where every gimmick they gave someone wasn't working. Yes, because it, it was Vince. Think about this. It had been 10 years since 1984. Vince was hitting the wall in terms of coming up with different things to make people or different gimmicks or different names or whatever. And at the same time, he wasn't getting anything fresh because there was no other territory now, pretty much, except for Memphis, which he was working with, and WCW, and, and me, which he was working with. So, Ed, but he was, he was almost impossible to talk Vince McMahon at that time into deviating from his formula his pattern whatever you wanted to call it that everybody had to have some kind of gimmick or character to make them interesting and bruce would parrot the same thing well it gives them personality no it makes them look like a fucking moron and and finally it wasn't until that vince for the first time ever started losing the ratings war that he would give up on that shit and there were some talents that were involved in that. Some didn't survive the bad gimmicks. Others, you could still save by just either kind of putting them out of the way for a little while so people wouldn't notice, or they just morphed kind of slowly. Or it, it, sometimes it was without Vince even noticing a, every little change and, you know, tweak. And then they were just a little bit more like wrestling characters instead of cartoon characters what 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 people i'll say this we'll get back on this program what people attribute and like shit stain loves it because it makes him look like he had something to do with it the the attitude era guys in the wwf didn't suddenly do something revolutionary in terms of getting away from cartoon gimmicks they just became more like the wrestling gimmicks already had been in most of the Southern and the more traditional wrestling territories, though, except they could cuss those guys, but they mean it and they're serious about shit. Right. Right. And, and so it wasn't revolutionary. It was just revolutionary to Vince. Otherwise it was the way that wrestlers had mostly always acted. We're not going to, if we're going to dress up in silly shit, but it's going to look like that we would really wear it and we're going to say shit that it looks like we'd really fucking say. But that was revolutionary for Vince because he was used to ice cream men and garbage men and fucking hillbillies and whatever the fuck that were stereotypes and you know very superficial portrayals of those rather than the real thing. Nevertheless, then <laughs> Triple H and The Rock got together in a big program that lasted about three whole years. Um, 
And then Rock went to the fucking movies and Triple H and his wife took over creative. But during that period of time when you see the footage, I don't care. I say this every time. It applies every time. Whether it's the stuff from the 80s or the stuff from the 90s, even the early 2000s. Not only do the guys that are doing it look better somehow, bigger, stronger, meaner, better, but it looks more violent. It looks more real, even in the kind of modern stuff where they're still crashing through the tables here, but it doesn't look like it's a goddamn set-up movie stunt being performed, and they don't look like they're jumping up in each other's arms to help execute the power slams. It looks like some dangerous-ass violent shit going on. It uh, You don't have to go back to 88. It looked that way in 98. I forgot the rock used to get color. But did, did, is it the same thing it, that, that you see that this shit looks somehow, the people are going ape shit, everybody's over, etc., but the shit looks more violent somehow? Yeah, and I mean, the aggressive, or not aggressive, but the lively crowd obviously plays into that. It was a different time. Is there more Is there more aggression from the talent that shows? Maybe. I mean, all the times you hear me talk about how lame The Rock is, the reason I say it is because how good he was there. And when you see that, and when you see him at his peak, and then you see him come back and do bad comedy, looking for cheap pops, that's why I call him lame, because he used to be amazing. We'll see what happens now, but that footage from that time period, especially when cut together right, looks incredible. Yeah. And <laughs> Triple H talks about the great chemistry they had in the ring. They did. This obviously was done, and a lot of it was shot, uh, maybe all of it, before uh, recent developments with The Rock. But they talked about the fact that they didn't like each other per se, personally. They didn't hang out together. That was true. That, that, that they each rubbed each other somewhat the wrong way and with two completely different personalities, you can understand. And that helped. It always helped when, you know, guys had a rivalry, but under there was underlying tension. But it also helps today. That's why I wish they hadn't showed the footage of them in more modern times where they were talking about, oh, yeah, it was great. We did this and that because they still need to have public friction now for what they're doing now, where they're probably going to draw more money with this whole Triple H content officer and rock board of directors thing than they drew when they were in the, the ring wrestling each other because the change in the economics, but they still need friction, right? So I wish they had kept up the idea that they never were friends and didn't hang out and and backed up a bit on the great chemistry they had in the ring. We could still get a little fucking doubt going, because it, it, let me ask you this, Brian. If you're a person who's smart to almost the entire wrestling business, but you would believe that two people were fairly egotistical maniacs, would Rock and Triple H be two of them? You would, it would be easy for you to believe that? Without question. Well, then that's why they need to keep that fucking idea. And I think it's true. I just think they don't want to show it publicly it, more than anything else. Well, I think, they, I think they should be magnifying it publicly right now. Absolutely. But anyway, that was Rivals. It's an amuse-bouche. It's a, it's a little soup son. It's, it's a little snack, as Mama Cornette would say, just enough to piss you off. Not a, a big amount of substance to it, but it's, it's a show that's there. And that happened. Well, Jim, that was another historical look back at WWE programming, and let's stay on the topic of uh, reviews. Did, did you say did you say historical or hysterical? Uh, it's up to you, really. It really uh, everyone has a goofy sense of humor in one way or another. But let's stay on the topic of reviews, or in other words, let's get them all out of the way now. <laughs> Monday Night Raw was it a historical episode this week for you? No, it was more in the hysterical category. No, we're not going to talk about this whole three-hour show because they had a bunch of matches in the way that that prevented us from, you know, uh, enjoying the monologues that they presented. But they presented some good monologues. So, and, and a lot of people think that I 
just think there should be no women's wrestling, that it should all just go away, just most of it, not all of it. I want to say something here at the outset for this, uh, the, the highlight of this Raw episode for me on February 26th was that they showed you how to make money with women's wrestling. And they, it, 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 I don't know why that this is so hard for people to grasp. It's not about the goddamn frilly costumes and the fucking sequiny faces and, oh, Zoe's mad at Lexi, who's mad at Liv, who's mad at... And they're all reciting fucking ridiculously sophomoric dreck in monotone voices trying to be bad actresses and a clump of fucking girl fighting going on well again let me stop you we're talking about raw we're not just talking about women's wrestling well what about the overall show any thoughts but, on uh, but no that's that's what i'm saying is here at the first segment this is how you sell women's red draw money with women's wrestling they have got a gold mine of promotional material associated with rhea ripley and becky lynch mommy versus the man all of the the lines that can come out of that and the puns that can be made. Um, and, uh, you know, mommy's always on top, but the ma a, a good woman is always behind a man or whatever the fuck, right? They're doing all this shit. Rhea Ripley is a fucking star. The people love her. Becky Lynch is a star. The people love her. They can both talk instead of going out there and droning on like, you know, fucking... Uh, as a high school play delivery, they sound like they mean it. And they can work in the ring and carry it off, and they've got the psychology. I don't, Becky Lynch has been around for a while. Rhea Ripley's a prodigy. But they know how to get themselves over, and they know what this shit's supposed to be. It's supposed to look like, and then sound like. And... Of course, Dominic, Rhea is still nominally a heel, even though the people love her. So it's not going to fuck up the 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 execution of the match and the build as much as if, if it was just two baby faces being mean and bitchy to each other for no fucking reason. And Dominic is involved. He's the one that was after the big Elimination Chamber package where... She was in the main event, one in her home country. Dominic's in the ring and gives her the, the introduction. And it goes automatically from their boo and dom out of the building to huge cheers for fucking Rhea and welcome to Monday Night Mommy. And they chant Mommy. But every if, if, while he's there, <laughs> anytime he still steps up to speak or makes any move, the people fucking hate him. But anything she does is golden. It's great. It's working. And she put herself over and did a great job. She's got the inflections and the facial. She's not delivering lines. She's not acting. She's being Rhea Ripley, Rhea Bloody Ripley. And in Becky's music, she does the entrance and she's over too. And she can say in her own way of being the man, all the shit that you need to say to Rhea Ripley, and they still like her too. But when did you see when Dominic interrupted, she called him a dirty kumquat? Shut up, you dirty kumquat. <laughs> Look, I saw. Uh, but anyway, the point is, you can see the promotional posters and the fucking graphics, mommy versus the man. And here was the here was the line Rhea had behind every great man is a greater woman, but I'm not behind you because mommy's always on top. And the way that they will be able to build this and the promos they'll get out of it, and I believe the match will be tremendous. But and also Becky's smaller, but she can sell. But she's not, even though she has no size to her, she's not like the frail fucking girly type she's fucking she's wiry as mama Cornette used to say uh so i'm looking forward to seeing this and this is what you do you get girls who for one reason or another can be big stars like this and compete at the main event level and you can throw charlotte in there and you can throw bianca belair in there and whatever we talk about 
AEW at some point, probably on the experience, I believe with 12 to 18 months in NXT, you could throw Statlander in there. She's just lost in AEW and will never get anywhere. But And then you make them stars. You just have other girls to just put them over and get them over, and then you make these big matches. When it's not half men and half women, a big match like this is going to be an even more special attraction. Oh, my God. But then, and they got all that done in eight minutes. A great promo, great confrontation. It lasted eight minutes, and then the refrigerator hit the fucking ring and beat up Becky and left her laying. And I, what the fuck? I thought we were done with that. You thought we were done with Nia and Rhea or Nia and Becky? I thought we were hopefully done with just that. Her. When, it. When The Rock resigns from the board of directors one day, we'll be done with Nia. Well, I mean, Jones. I thought she could go and she can fight some of the girls we don't give a shit about. Let her sit on Chelsea well, yeah. Green every week. <laughs> Let's not volunteer people to get squashed, uh, literally. Um, but you know, there's a place for Nia Jax on that roster, considering some of the other people on that roster, but you said it, <sighs> there may be, I was thinking about this earlier and we'll talk about something after the raw review that relates to it. If you think about the top flight women wrestlers in the States, we don't watch Japanese women's wrestling. So we're not up on who's great over there. So we're just talking about what we see domestically. Top flight can be in a main event. You have Ripley, Charlotte, Bianca, Becky. I'll put Bailey on that list. She's proven herself. I'm trying to think of any other names. I mean, I, I was going to say, are there two handfuls so of people? Many names running through my mind. Some people would say Mercedes Monet. But are there, are there 10 people? Are there 10 women in America who are top flight women's wrestlers? And then the other problem is the gap. You know, there are top flight male wrestlers, and then there are wrestlers not just there yet, but on the way up. The gap between the top flight women's wrestlers, like the ones I named, and the ones who have no idea what the fuck they're doing, or, you know, just convince themselves they're wrestlers, but don't actually show any of the skills, or aren't over in any way. Crowd reaction is a part of pro wrestling. Since Sonnenberg, you know, <laughs> crowd reaction is a big deal. Hey, they used to give Fred Beal hell, too, I'm telling that's you. That's true, that's true. That Ole Marsh really got the crowd in an uproar. Boy, I tell you. But, uh... Well, I know, I, I see what you're... But, again, that's where you try to... to grow your own, to train them, to find them. Again, Statlander, from what I saw... And we're not going to get into the AEW show. It's not worth it. We'll do that later. Uh, But Statlander... I think you give her 12 to 18 months at a good training program. I think if she keeps her knees together, I think she could have it. And she's got the size. And I think there's something going on in her head that it looks like she could get herself over if she was in a place where anybody was allowed to. Yeah, and she came from a good training school. That's where MJF went. So she obviously knows something. Well, but the but, but point is, you know, th there's one I'm thinking of. And, her, you know... We might be able to find another couple, but that's why I'm saying if it's if it's a special attraction amongst these handful of big stars and all the other little planets and moons rotate around them, and it was a little bit more limited, and the only thing you saw of women's wrestling was the really good ones doing their shit against another really good one, or who gives a shit? She just beaten her. Then, then most. Long-time wrestling fans would not roll their eyes and groan every time. Is what is this? A fucking Girl Scout television or wrestling? See, and again, we never get to see if it will do well on its own. There's no dedicated show where they could treat it seriously, book it right, develop it. We went from, let's say, the beginning of Raw. I don't think a Lunger Blaze came in until what? Late 93, early... Yeah, I guess she was there uh, for WrestleMania. So she was there in 93, by the summer. Yeah. Um, there was one women's feud in the company. It was Alundra Blaze versus whoever she was feuding with. Bull Nakano, then uh, Ronda Singh, or um, Bertha Faye. A match or two at Heidi Lee Morgan or someone here and there. It shouldn't be that. There's three hours of Raw now. 
And also there's a better... I shouldn't and say two that. hours of SmackDown. And two hours of SmackDown. But you don't need... The men have a tag team division. We need a tag team division. The men have this, so we need this. It should be, there's a demand for this. Let's address the demand. Not, there's no demand for this. Let's give them more. <laughs> That's not a smart strategy. Ah, and there are top flight women. If this show had a Rhea Ripley segment every week, I'm going to watch this show every week. You could say the same primarily about some of the other ones. And you know what, Io Sky or Asuka, I actually would put on that list. I know you wouldn't, but I would. There are several other women okay, in that if, company. Okay, if there, if there weren't 12 other Asian-American or Asian-Asian women dressing or acting the same way with approximately the same size and the same height and being promoted the same way... There aren't. There are no women being presented or promoted the same way Asuka is. No one. Eo Sky. I'm st is, Eo Sky standing, doesn't wear makeup. Is there, she is there an inch difference? Is the, 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 they're grunting and groaning? Ah, the stereotypical, you know, Japanese sailor on Gilligan's Island promos. I think you may be thinking of Kyrie Sane. Possibly. Well, see, there you go. Which one's which? Well, they all have them do the same shit. Again, I think that's. I think there are Japanese women wrestlers who stand out on their own in the states, and I think Asuka happens to be one of them. And she's been presented pretty well over the years. You know who stood out? Gail Kim, because she not only could work, she could speak English. She was an Asian American, or no, she was an Asian Canadian. I'm sorry, but she had a completely different appeal. And then all of the other girls who were blonde and the big booby bimbos and whatever. And she could work and she could talk genuinely. And she acted like a real human instead of, I'm going to kill you. The fuck is that? How does that get, would that be offensive if it was shown in Japan? Asuka's a bigger star than Gail Kim ever was. Gail Kim was really good, and Gail Kim was maybe the best women's wrestler at that time for what was whatever, the Divas division or something. And then she went to TNA and did good stuff there. The women's division in TNA at times when it was Gail Kim and Kong may have been the best thing in TNA. Yeah. I'm not saying that, that she, that Asuka is not a, a bigger star now with this worldwide television than Gail Kim. I'm McDonald's sells more cheeseburgers than anybody. Doesn't mean they're the fucking best. No, but again, Gail Kim's not, I don't know how Gail Kim got pulled into this just because she's Asian, I guess. But Oscar, my point was Oscar's on that list for me. All right. There aren't a lot of women there. If you had one good dedicated woman's feud on SmackDown and two on Raw and not a lot of filler, and not a lot of people just smiling and bouncing around, and you can't even figure out why. I think it would be better. But instead, it became like, you know, when AEW started, we're going to give women the same salaries as men, which never happened. <laughs> but it's because people wanted to hear that. It wasn't because it was a thing to do that was the right thing for business based on ticket sales or anything else. It was just... It was, oh, aren't they nice? Yeah, that's the issue. That's the issue. There's too much stuff being done for that reason, as opposed to there's a demand. You know, there's no midget wrestling on these shows anymore. Part of that reason is people enjoyed it, but there was no demand for it. If there was a demand, Raw would be filled. Some would say Raw is filled with them. <laughs> well, how Raw does that say? Remember, we've already said that Tony Khan is running the second most popular midget wrestling promotion because the big little brawlers over there on Discovery are. Hanging with them in the ratings, right? I don't know. It's, it's, uh, they're trying to make something come to reality that may not, unless they really did it the right way. Give them a show. Give the women a one hour or two hour weekly show and give them a, a good booking team. Give them good trainers. Get out, get Alexandra Pepperday on that. No, she's busy. I, I'm, su I'm sure she's under a long term contract, but. I don't know why you got me going on this, but I like the Rhea Ripley Becky segment. I thought that was well, great. You you sound indignant over the whole thing, but yes, and I did too. And that was the highlight of the television program, pretty much. Uh, and then we got a lot of you know that pesky wrestling stuff, and then came the nine o'clock hour, and we had Gunther and his Imperium forces in the ring, and he promo cut the promo on. 
beaten Jey Uso last week, and he's such a condescending dick kind of heel. Nobody's perfect, but I am very close. Did you notice when he addressed his future, when he's, who will I face at WrestleMania? He said some names. He said Sami Zayn, and it was kind of a small pop. He said Chad Gable, and it got a bigger pop than Sami Zayn. Sami has cooled off considerably. Then he said Miz, which got the same kind of pop as, as Gable. And then he said R-Truth, and that got the biggest pop. Because I guess everybody's like you. They're just tickled by him. He does do stupid well. But anyway. Although I think, that, I think Gable was a genuine pop. I think R-Truth was more... It you know, was more the, the ironic pop. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, let's make this whole thing a fucking joke. Yeah, you know, what if he says uh, the ring announcer? Oh! I think that's more what that was. Yeah. But Gable, I think people have taken the Gable, and he's been treated more seriously. Well, I remember they had a, actually a couple of good ones. Yeah. So, you know, but the point is, he mentions all those names of them. Sami Zayn got the smallest pop. One year ago, he's in the main event in his hometown for the title. Just a thought. Anyway. So then the Judgment Day music plays, and here comes Priest and the guys. Rio was not there. And this pains me. And I mean, all is not lost, but Priest, we, we were a fan. We saw him and we went in NXT before he came up, right? He's got a great voice. He's got size. He works hard. There's some things about his work. He's not going to go down in history as the second coming of, you know, Terry Funk or Jack Briscoe, but... The problem, I think, now is that he always works hard. You can tell he wants to get over. He's got a lot of the tools. I think either he's either he's not gotten any more confidence speaking or he's lost some that he had. Because remember you said uh, here a week or so ago, I said, what happened to fucking the Judgment Day are supposed to be the top guys? All of a sudden, a bunch of people shot past him. Finn's got a ceiling at this point. JD may live in a fucking. You know, he's good. One, what, he, but yeah, but he's, he's, good. he's when Gunther was talking about them and challenging them each individually or saying something, and then he said the big headed one. Yeah, the guy with the big <laughs> head. But but no, seriously, what I'm talking about, I'm being serious. JD, his ceiling may be at a one level ranch house. Finn's probably at his ceiling now. Dominic is, you know, got a bright future, but Priest would be the one you would think would be a main event singles level guy first out of this group, and he needs more menace, not only verbally, but in his body language and when he's confronting somebody. He needs more menace and conviction in what he's saying. His facials need to, he needs to sound and look more genuinely aggressive and you know, uh, I could see a guy that looks like that almost having that fucking David Schultz thing, which was a shoot, not something that he was a work with him. You saw it right before he slapped the shit out of John Stossel, where not only do you see it on his face and he's shifting a little bit back and forth, but he's also, he's got the bottom of his t-shirt. Remember that? He's wringing his t-shirt in his hands like he can't wait to fucking slap somebody. It, it, a priest doesn't sound like he's like he's confident does he realize they've cooled off and he he sounds like he's trying to talk himself into it as the boys used to say when i got into business did you get that or am i just trying to pay too much attention he went from always sounding strong to those backstage segments where all of a sudden it would go from yo dominic ria hey all truth i like you hey, you're okay you're like no one wanted that no one wanted the drama <laughs> with them backstage they were great until that but that, now that he's started faced, cooling off the judgment yeah. day was the backstage drama segments. But he's face to face with Gunther. And he's he's meek in he's meeker than he should be. He's saying the right things, but it don't sound like he believes them to me. I think he needs more presence, more menace. Can you imagine? Go back and think of an attitude era promo. Would goddamn Austin have been up in fucking Gunther's shit? Could someone be held back by either their gimmick or more specifically in this case, the faction they're with, the 
the gimmick they've had for a while. They kind of, they need some kind of change just to bring a different energy out of them. Hey, I, well, I'm, I'm, hey, anytime I was out there, I don't care. When I was out there with the dynamic dudes, I still had energy, right? You know, you, they can't tell you not to have energy. And, and you, anyway, the point is, this was pre, finally, when Gunther was taunting him, Priest went to lift the case up and Dominic stopped him and started talking. And of course, the people are booing and et cetera. But Dominic's went, that title belongs to, to us. It wasn't, he wasn't making the challenge. It was us. And Gunther shoves Dominic and Priest goes for him and the Judgment Day are holding Priest back. And the fans were with it. They wanted to see him fight. But they didn't fight, and and that was it. I'm 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 pulling for Priest, but he needs to. I mean, he's not gonna be a screaming, malevolent, fucking, you know, psychopath. But he could have more more Jake Roberts style aggression, you know, low simmer, and in, in his day, not not as he got into his drug days but well they were all drug days with jake but it would before it affected him when he was really sinister you could see priest doing something just some he just he didn't sound like he believed that he was going to kick anybody's ass no this might, right. this is the first time in a few years that he isn't he doesn't feel as effective as he did in nxt you know it felt like in nxt he was used well and he showed a lot of personality and then it took him a little bit of a while to get over the hump in WWE because he was presented as a babyface. And then the Judgment Day kind of gave him a break, especially when they got rid of, uh, not Christian, Edge. Not Edge, Adam yeah. Copeland. Once they got rid of him for that, it gave him a chance to really shine. It's taken a step backwards for the first time. Yeah. But anyway... So then there was some other shit going on, and then we got to the 10 o'clock hour for our next monologue. And this was with Drew McIntyre, uh, who came out and thanked the fans. We did it. <laughs> he thanked the fans for praying so hard, and now it's going to be him versus Seth for the world title at WrestleMania. And he's such a great smartass. And it, it's it, it, you don't often find a guy that size, that big, that can make smartassery work. But he's it is like a fucking loudmouth prick like me, right? But he's making smartassery work. He said he he busted his eardrum at at the uh, pay per view, and it was painful. The doctor said that he might not be able to make WrestleMania, and Drew said, "Who do you think I am, CM Punk?" And he sat cross-legged down in the ring and and mocked Punk. So that's going to be a, a great program when Punk gets back. And he even said that he knows that Punk is straight edge, so he drank twice as much to celebrate after the big win. And then he calls out Seth, and Seth comes out, and ah, Seth was more sing-songy and silly Seth Say that three times fast. She sells seashells by the seashore. Seth was more sing-songy, silly Seth than he has been lately, but McIntyre's point was that he doesn't understand why Seth is involved with Cody and the bloodline and the rock and that whole thing, because when Drew, when he's a champion, he is not going to care if SmackDown's on fire. He's just going to take care of himself. And Drew doesn't want the bloodline to be pissed at Seth to come out and fuck him around at the, at WrestleMania and taint his big victory. Of course, he just got a tainted victory from the bloodline last week on TV. Then he drew, but anyway, he makes the big pitch to Seth. And while Seth is thinking about it, the fans sing, I wish they'd have sung the jeopardy music instead of, whoa, whoa, whoa. Shouldn't they have gone ding, 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 ding. But anyway, so then Seth responds with an inspirational speech that I'm sure sounded good to him when he was working on it in the back. Some risks are worth taking. Drew, you might be right. All those things might happen. 
I might get fucked over by the bloodline, and they might, they're, they're both, but what if you're wrong? Because then he goes on this long, drawn, I felt empty inside till I had my daughter, and now he's become more honorable of a fucking human being, and taken down the bloodline is bigger than us. I think I bought the heels fucking pitch over the baby faces pitch here. Didn't you? I mean, he was completely insincere, but this whole thing was ridiculous. And I like Drew McIntyre. He's been doing great stuff. And he was good here for what they gave him to do. But he he was good until Seth came. <laughs> and Rollins has been good lately with the serious stuff. But this is so, it was, I mean, no, this was kind of the, the white meat baby face shit they booed Rocky Maivia for. It's bigger than us. I don't care if things happen to me in my world title. We've got to, st no, fuck. It just, it was too long and dramatic and blah. You know, Drew is going to get over as a fucking smart ass heel because now he's entertaining when he speaks. And also because most people would say, well, you know, you're right. If you win a title, fuck what the other TV show's doing. You shouldn't care if they were on fire. Uh, so, but anyway, that, um, that, that it didn't do it for me this week on that one. Oh, but, oh, but wait, did, did the, the, the finish of the main event we got to talk about. I forgot about this because did, did you see it or did you give up at that point? I don't remember. What was the main event? Well, we're a bit, the main event was Cody and Grayson Waller. And I didn't watch that, but they gave us a little bonus content afterward. Did you zone out since it was Waller? I don't know. You're going to have to refresh me. I, you know what? Waller's growing on me. He has been for a while. Well, so does Theor cancer. Theory's the one that's becoming tough to watch. Waller's the one who's actually becoming pretty good. That's because they're having Waller do all the shit Theory ought to be doing. Was that the fin? Was, th was the Theory coming and get his ass kicked again? Well, no, but hold on. <laughs> it was the Paul Heyman Oh, that's right. That's right. I did see that. Yes, if this was an episode of the Big Bang Theory, it would be titled The Paul Heyman Interruption. And if, folks, if you didn't see it real quickly, Cody's match is over, he's celebrating, the music is playing, and all of a sudden, Heyman interrupts, bringing out three guys dressed in black, not suits, but just black attire of various kinds. One had a jacket and a black shirt, the other had a black, whatever, they're all in black. And it's obviously three, you know, indie outlaw, you know, independent wrestlers, right? But he claims that they are three friends of his from the NYPD that are off duty. Well, actually, they're suspended, but that's a whole different story. Brian, you have probably, I've seen officers with the New York Police Department. I'm sure you see them on a semi-regular basis. Do any of them look like that? Uh, well, I mean, you know, some of the recruits, uh, or young guys do, but no, we have a lot of friends on the department. Some yeah, up, and, and so. most, most of them uh, goddamn look like some fucking guy that you'd see on the beat in Queens or wherever the fuck, I don't know your geography up there, but they don't look like fucking indie wrestlers all dressed in black and groomed appropriately. Well, no, they're certainly not all dressed in black. The grooming's an interesting issue that's coming up. Uh, it's becoming an issue again with the police, but anyway. The police are grooming people now? No, the New York City Police Department thinks that the cops have been given, or at least, I forget who exactly it was, whether it was the, it wouldn't have been a union, it must have been the people high up in the department, they think the cops are dressing too sloppy, and they kind of want to tighten up uh, the restrictions on what you can and can't do in terms of facial hair and all sorts of things. Yeah, well, and it, these three were too clean, too young, and, in, and probably in too fucking uh, good of a shape. Generally, the ones that I'd see when I'd go up there would be fat, slovenly, and hairy. Yeah, but never There aren't that many of those kind of cops anymore. It's kind of the other way. Well, God, well, then that's what we need is more fat, hairy, slovenly cops, and this the country wouldn't be going to hell. But besides that, Paul comes out with these three fake cops and says, <laughs> Cody, I, I know it's embarrassing that you got Will Smithed by The Rock, but take The Rock's name out of your mouth. And Paul begs him in a menacing and, I, you know, not really serious way, pretty please, pretty please, cherry on top, withdraw your challenge to The Rock. Or, or to the... Actually, did he say that with your chat? Instead of Roman, there was some... 
fumble of the verbiage there. I forget but, exactly what he said. I mean, I knew what he meant. But yeah, but anyway, you know, get out of this while you still can type of ultimatum being given by Paul Heyman. And Cody fires back up and, you know, he's like, we were fans of The Rock. Is this is this a talking point that The Rock insisted on to turn heel was that everybody had to say, now we all were fans of his before. Because Cody said that two or three times now. Somebody else has said it. The fans boo it every time that they don't want to be grouped in that anymore. But it's got to be a talking point, mandatory talking point. Does it not at this at this juncture? Who knows? I mean, it could be. It could be. I'm, I'm thinking let's, let's get some of our uh, undercover investigators to weigh in on that. But nevertheless... <laughs> We were all fans of The Rock, but now I'm done with being nice. Come and get me. And Paul's three guys get up on the apron and and they surround Cody. And Paul's going to get in the ring, but Cody said, don't do it. (laughs) The next person that takes a step toward me, I'll drop you. I'll drop all of you. And Paul said, of course, that doesn't mean me. And he said, yes, it does. And then guess what Cody does? He dropped all the guys dressed in black, all the cops who somehow knew how to take bumps out of the ring, over the top rope, whatever the case. And you know what? The problem is, I know they can't have The Rock there every week. They can't have Roman there every week. If they are there every week, they can't have them fight with Cody every week. It would get old and repetitive, right? But the problem is now they've gotten too comfortable on all these wrestling programs with what is obviously should be named the random Star Trek crewman syndrome. When Kirk and Spock and Scotty and Sulu and Lieutenant Schmidlap beam down to the planet's surface, who's getting vaporized, Brian? I don't know. Lieutenant Schmidlap. Because we've never seen him before, and chances are we'll never see him again. And every time the security or the off-duty cops or the guy on AEW last week, they also they threw somebody in the front row. Oh, it was old Blue Sky got thrown into the front row, and it was obviously outlaw wrestlers who took bumps and laid their selling from this 120-pound girl. And they're guys. They're all guys. From this girl being dropped on them, four men were fucking wiped out. It's phony because you can tell it, they all look the same, even though they're not the same people. They all look awkward and unnatural, and they don't fit the fucking visual representation of what they're being presented as. And as a result, it's the fucking random Star Trek crewman syndrome. You know they're there just to get beat up. And it it's old, right? And then... Paul gets one phone out of his pocket and calls Roman and gets the other phone out of his other pocket and calls the rock. So God, he better have stock in T-Mobile or something because this is getting Spenskiff. But if Cody beat up all of the fucking job guys, there you go. Well, that was raw. It certainly was. You insisted on watching it for the record. Jim, as we are recording, we're not going to go through this now. We'll see. The Rock has uploaded a 21-minute video to Twitter <laughs> doing a promo on Cody Rhodes. Good Lord, for 21 minutes. For tw- Apparently, he uploaded a shorter version and then added another six minutes uh, <laughs> and re-uploaded it, according to one of the things I see here. And, he re- and here's another thing. <laughs> so you know what, you know what the problem is going to be now? He's going to work overtime doing this to get himself over as a baby face being a heel as opposed to being a heel rock. That's what I'm afraid of. So the old uh, reverse psychology method. By overloading it with classic rock stuff that eventually with all the insults, when you insult someone like that and they never get a comeback, and Cody's not going to get a good insult comeback from, <laughs> with the rock, eventually that heel becomes the baby face. But we'll see. Let's monitor that situation. Did you see that The Rock has been given all the intellectual property to everything he ever did? And apparently everything he ever said. The nation? I mean, everything. It's insane. Every word that came out of his mouth, though, Rudy Pooh candy ass, is now 
fucking owned by the rock and all the other shit. It doesn't matter. If you and, smell what the rock is, every single phrase, every faction he was in, every nickname he ever had, TKO, I, along with $15 million in compensation this year and next year for being on the board of directors, gave that to him. My question for you is this. TKO previously did this with Vince McMahon when the whole deal went down for the purchase of the company. You know, he has his rights to uh, his life story, his name, everything. Should WWE, should TKO, a company looking to exist in the future, make money in the future, make money specifically off its intellectual property in the future, should they be doing a deal like this? Was it necessary? Was it going to cause the deal not to happen if you didn't turn over everything he ever did to him? Is it a dangerous precedent? Again, if you're a business built on intellectual property and content, when all of a sudden you give someone else that, there's no guarantee someone's on a board of directors forever. I've always said that. EVPs come and go. There are no guarantees that someone's going to be on a board of directors forever. There's no guarantee TKO will exist the way it does today forever. Is it a smart business move to give Dwayne Johnson, here specifically, or any wrestler, everything they ever did if your business model is built on owning that? Well, that's a difficult question with multiple parts. But first, here's the thing. With Vince, they would still have, and with Rock, they can still air the footage. And they, right. they're they not having yeah. to pay, you know, Rock every time that, you know, like yesterday plays in an elevator and Paul McCartney gets seven cents or whatever. But they're he has having... the merchandising rights on anything he said. Yes. But here's here's the, the point that I was going to make. In a case like this, with Vince, they... They had to give him his rights because he wasn't going to put his rights in anybody else's hands. That was, he never has and, and never is going to, or never was going, going to. So that was part of the deal. I understand that to get the company sold and et cetera. Now they kind of look pretty good for doing that because I don't know that they want to exploit Vince McMahon's name very much in the future. But with The Rock, I'm so, if he's there for two years, they're going to get close to $30 million out of him just on this WrestleMania thing, just be, uh, in publicity or, uh, you know, uh, TV they didn't have to buy and pay for because he's the rock and he got on it or, you know, whatever the fuck, the sponsorship. I'm not even talking about the compensation. I don't think I agree. But no, but, but hold on. Well, and that's why I'm, if he's around for two more years... And yes, they're still going to have to compensate him for the match or whatever, but if he if he's around involved for two more years, they can milk that that name and that, you know, his presence. I think they're looking at it like fuck, it's the fucking rock. We'll give him these trademarks, these licenses, whatever. We're going to generate an extra how many five figure million dollars off of him being around. So I say five figure, uh, eight figure, I should say. But in the future, you know, we're talking about going into the future. If everything he does over the next two years is record breaking business and stuff that we're talking about, the way we talk about the attitude error romantically today in the future, but you can't merchandise any of it. You can't put anything well, he says on t-shirts. You can't even sell t-shirts of him without a deal with him now because of this. Yeah, but that's one guy in their universe. They're not going to make that deal for anybody else maybe and almost anybody else assuredly so for one guy to get what they want it's we're if we're talking tens of millions of dollars they don't care because they're talking in billions of dollars now that's the fucking thing we would talk about you know they can give people 20 million dollars just go away boy you bother me it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't matter to them anymore about the Rock's trade. They've been selling the T-shirts for 20 years. Now they give him all this shit. He comes in, he draws him money for another couple of years. It's tens of millions of dollars. My question was, Who's should the they? My question was, should they have done that? I don't have a problem with them doing it for this, for this in this situation because of what everybody's getting out of it. But they, for the most part, should not. And remember, I've said that Vince never wanted to do this this type of thing or this particular thing or let guys, you know, do this or that. 
to set a precedent to upset the locker room, to upset the pay scale, or to say, well, you did for so-and-so, what about me? These people don't care. Because also, not, not only are they, you know, they the Hollywood deal makers that can try to talk you into anything, but if they can't, they can just say, well, then fuck you then. You can go home because we don't need you. We are traded on the New York Stock Exchange and we're worth $25 billion or whatever the fuck, and you're goddamn, you know, Kevin Owens or whoever the fuck. We don't care that we're paying you $2 million. Go away. It's nothing to us. It's trading stamps. Can you argue with that? I don't, I think it's crazy to give any of these wrestlers, if your business model is based on the merchandising and all the rights to everything going forward, you, it's crazy to give anyone, especially one of the biggest merch movers in the history of the business, the rights to everything. Then you know what Bill Watts would say, don't you? What would he say? If a guy came up and said, well, The Rock got his rights, I want my rights. Well, go be The Rock. Well, that's go the thing. Go throw me as much money as The Rock did. And I'll give you some rights. It's one of those small things, though, that could swing a pendulum. I want the rights to all my stuff. We're not going to give it to you. Tony, I want the rights to everything. I'll give you whatever the fuck you want. Just come over here and tell your friends. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, that's one of those things that could be a good negotiating tactic now. Well, I want not- the rights to my name that I developed, I came up with. You guys copyrighted behind my back. You guys own it. I can't do anything without your permission. I want the rights to it like The Rock got. The Rock wants to be one of the boys. I'm one of the boys. I want the rights to my stuff. You won't give it to me, Tony will. And and at this point, I think that TKO at the top would say, well, then go go fucking talk to Tony, because Tony swing like a pendulum do. But we <laughs> but we don't swing that way, baby. We ain't giving you dick. Would you give Steve Austin the rights to his stuff? What, right now? Right now. See, that's the thing. If a record producer all of a sudden gives one artist their publishing, all the that's what caused the Eagles to break away from fucking David Geffen. What do you mean you gave fucking, uh, what's his name? Jackson Brown his yeah. publishing. What about us? They didn't get it. They broke away and they started a feud that still exists, I think, to this day between Don Henley and David Geffen. Well, anyway, I was, I was back breathing about Steve Austin. I don't want to leave him hanging. That would be one that you would have to look at based on what does he what does he want to do and what can he do now. And Steve lives a quieter life by choice and is not out and goddamn on TMZ every week like The Rock is. And, you know, so that if you're a top I, guy I, in the I company now. I don't know that there's anybody past Austin and Rock and Roman Reigns. He doesn't own the rights to his name. He can't use his name in outside ventures without company permission. See, I, th- I, I don't think even Roman, I don't think they should give up anything on. I think if you're talking about guys who were at that level, maybe Taker at this point, why not? You know, it, yeah, there's a it, great was, example. He doesn't own the rights to his name. But but that's one that I would say, why not go ahead and, you know, do that? It's a retirement plan. If you still keep a presence and keep good with the company and you're a megastar, Austin rock taker after 20 years, you get your shit. I don't know, but it would have to be people at that level and, and hardly any farther down and nobody active. What would taker have been in WCW dead Mark? <laughs> made the ju- like what would they have called him if he had made the jump? It would have to have referred to him no, being he a would, dead man, right? He would have been stone dead. Steve Williams, Steve Williams. They would have changed. Yeah. The undertaker's it's, name it's to stone Steve. Cold Steve Austin. He'd been stone dead. Steve Williams. Well, this has been our talk about The Rock, but on the topic of WWE finances, Jim, word came out this week, and I believe Brandon Thurston was the first one to discover this going through the financials of uh, TKO, that a $20 million settlement was reached <laughs> last year, an antitrust settlement, and it turns out this is the MLW lawsuit, where MLW said that they had, I guess, text messages from Stephanie McMahon or a history of phone calls from Stephanie McMahon to various parties that MLW was trying to get their there was two on. two B T V was two involved. B T V. You know, again, it was always a two sided thing. One was WWE absolutely treats everything like they're a monopoly and absolutely tries to squash everyone. And on the other side, MLW is an industry wide joke who's never <laughs> going anywhere and everyone rolls their eyes at everything involving Court Bauer. 
Well, but wouldn't you know who won the pony, Brian? That's right. $20 million, $20 million. And let me just say, as an, as an ex-promoter, I could have run Smoky Mountain Wrestling or, for that matter, Ohio. Well, Smoky Mountain Wrestling, I could have run and not done anything differently in terms of talent, matchmaking, buildings run, whatever. The only thing I would have changed is I wouldn't ever have charged a dime for a ticket. And I could have still run it for 20 years on $20 million. And in OVW, I was about to say, we could, but no, with Danny Davis at the helm, we could have run Ohio Valley Wrestling without charging a goddamn penny for a ticket for 40 years on $20 million. Well, of course, some of that money will be going to the attorneys, one of which was Court Bauer's wife, but she's I was part of say a law related firm. To, related to Court yeah. Bauer. And also, I'm sure a large chunk of this money will go to the hardworking wrestlers. Well, yes, because right there, you know, now that everybody knows that <laughs> Court got 20. Yeah, no more mystery. How come we're not getting paid working here? Now you know Court has money. For comparison, in 1986, which was the best year that Jim Crockett promotions ever had, and obviously it, every, everybody's seen the footage from 86, sold out Philadelphia, sold out goddamn Baltimore, sold out fucking Charlotte, sold out whatever, they grossed $21 million. <laughs> That's, and now they got a check over at MLW for $20 million. Now, I know for a fact that main event guys in 1986 working for Jim Crockett were making between $150,000 and $250,000, and Flair and Dusty were making more than that. I know because I was one of them. And so I'm thinking that now the MLW wrestlers, holy shit, they're going to be fucking farting through silk, as Nick Goulas would say. But... Here's the, obviously, one of two instances were at play here. Either son of a gun, they really had proof that they could back up in court that WWE had tampered with their business, and that's why that, that they got that settlement, or... Yeah, because they didn't want to go to Discovery. TKO said, there's no well, way we can go to Discovery. You're jumping my oar. Or they might not have won because they might not have had proof, but in the process of coming to that conclusion, a bunch of shit would have to be said in public that TKO didn't want said. And that's why they give him, tw will he take 20 million? Just give him 20 million dollars. Get 20 million. Who gave, Bill, raid petty cash, see if we got 20 million in the drawer. But one of those two, th either they could prove it and WWE said, oh, fuck. Or elsewise, they just, oh, geez, we're going to have to fucking have a bunch of shit known and we don't want to do that, so what will this guy take to go away? But either way, it's $20 million. MLW just became the second most profitable wrestling promotion in the goddamn world, didn't they? Well, they did, and I was going to ask you, you know, with all the talk that AEW needs a big television rights renewal for all three shows to reach profitability... Should AEW look to sue WWE this year to get the profitability a little early? I don't think they're... I don't know that WWE could pay a judgment <laughs> that would be large enough to get Tony out of the fucking hole without just saying, fuck it, we'll close up. That's think about it. They're not going to spend that much money to get out of anything. You know, this opens an interesting door, though. For anyone who had anything related to antitrust or just any sort of predatory practices with the previous ownership... This ownership doesn't want that shit coming out. If anyone needs to pay their rent, now's the time. I guess that's what I'm saying. See, for Vince to lose a suit or to settle was against his nature because it was like admitting that somebody else was better than him, somebody else's dick was bigger. He didn't want to do that. He didn't want to be known for doing it. It was the same thing, whereas... Remember, it, it, Turner would settle any kind of lawsuit back in the WCW days because they'd had such problems outside the wrestling sector that they had with racial discrimination and sexual discrimination and other... They just started settling lawsuits. That's why all the guys knew they could sue. But you didn't have that many guys suing Vince, and the ones that did usually didn't get anything out of it. Remember that fucking lawyer Constantine Kairos that, you know... 
so yeah, obviously Vince is gone, but he didn't want to do that as a as as a personal fucking you know principle. But the, again, did you ever hear people, about when, when Jesse Ventura beat him and he got I think like seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars for back royalties and really established wrestlers getting royalties for videotapes as a thing? Then I think Jesse Ventura said the night he won, Vince called him up and like very angrily said, "That's my money." Yeah. And Jesse said, no, Vince, the judge said it's my money, <laughs> <You know? laughs> which I'm sure Vince must have loved Jesse because he didn't back but, down at all. <laughs> but no, but now hold on. You we misspoke about one thing. It wasn't he didn't get wrestlers royalties because the wrestlers were already getting the royalties. He got the announcer royalties. Yes, because he discovered and that's what caused Vince or the WWF to, at the time to change the contracts the way they were written. Because Jesse had been a wrestler, but when he he told me in the airport, I see him. It's he's just. He, when did he start? Eighty five or eighty six? Doing the commentary. Eighty five, maybe late eighty four, but eighty five for sure. Okay, well, I'm then probably it was Dallas. I'm in Dallas. I'm walking through the airport. I see Jesse coming the other way. I knew him from Memphis. I said, Jesse, how are you? I didn't know that he had been out for a while. He's oh, I've been out for. Several months, I think, you know, the blood clots, I think it's for Agent Orange in Vietnam. And he said, I just got back from doing commentary on about a dozen Titan tapes. I'm starting to do color. <laughs> and, but that's the thing is that he assumed he was going to get royalties because he was a personality when he was doing the announcing, even though they had never given announcers royalties but they didn't have it in the contract specifically that announcers weren't to get royalties. When Jesse won that case, that's when they, they edited him out of every single thing they had with him on audio. Now yes. It's back. And, but, but they also changed the contracts because, you know, it was specifically mentioned that, you know, announcers didn't get royalties or whatever. Now nobody gets royalties, but, Back then, it was it was decent. To circle back to uh, the issue at hand here, MLW getting this money, let's end with this. You talk to wrestlers, I talk to wrestlers. You've worked there. You were maybe the highest paid person when you worked there. Because yes, what, res <laughs> what wrestlers <laughs> talk about is the lack of pay from MLW. Now, well, and, and, and I'm not saying that to be a prick. And I was only temporary, you know, to begin with, but they needed a color commentator and they thought because of my popularity uh, on the podcast and etc but but no they were there was not i don't think there was a wrestler on the card making even four figures for fuck's sake and you know they they couldn't get me for that so technically i was the highest paid talent to come in and do color just because you can't get a name that has some leverage for that amount of money, it's people that are wanting to get over and wanting to get on some type of TV and wanting to get famous. But anyway, did, were you finishing your question? Well, my point was going to be this. The wrestlers notoriously, and I've talked to plenty who have said it to me directly, don't make money there, aren't happy there, feel locked into a contract they can't escape from. Uh, someone once told me they felt like they were held for ransom to see, <laughs> to see if another company would buy out the contract. Were they kidnapped, tied up, and taken away first? Now, MLW doesn't draw big houses. They don't have big things happening. They have a lot of small things happening. They have an action figure line, I think, with Boss Fight Studios, which is a good toy brand or a good toy company. They have TV deals, but I've been privy to a couple of them from TV sources of mine. They're not like the Vice deal they had that went away quick. Like They're not big money deals. So they've had lots of little things, but no big income sources. But if you know, if you work there and now you know these guys got all this money for all the work you were doing in front of, you know, small crowds and not making much money, but now they're getting all the money. Does that affect wrestlers in MLW now or going forward? It's going to be a topic of discussion. I can't imagine any, I'm, I don't even know specifically who's the talent in the locker room there, who's working there, whatever now, but I have never worked in a wrestling promotion or in a territory or whatever that if, if we heard in the locker room that the promoter suddenly got $20 million, that it wouldn't be a topic of conversation and holy shit, you know, daddy needs a new pair of shoes down here. 
So it's going to be interesting to see what what efforts they make to spread a little bit of that around and create some goodwill before it festers and it costs a lot more if it can be done. If court went to all of them and said, hey, as you know, we recently, apparently all of you know now, we recently got a windfall and everyone is going to be bonused for their hard work and we're also going to be expanding our operations. We're going to have more shows for you to work and we're going to try to get some better equipment here or, you know, upgrade the promotion in some kind of way. But if they fucking took 50 grand and divided it amongst their key people and, and people saw a bonus of a couple grand or whatever, that would go a long way to, you know, to allaying the festering that might happen if all of a sudden... <laughs> They see the fucking promoter pull it up in a long stretch limo and there's great new cameras and the fucking monitors look great, but we're still working for $125 or whatever. You see what I'm saying? But again, it's factual. Can you can you deny this statement that if they if they declare the $20 million as income on this year's taxes, they will be the second most profitable wrestling promotion in the world? You know, if they declare $15 million or $12 million after the lawyers and whatever other fees they have, it'd still be the most profitable, rest, the second most profitable wrestling company this year. Yeah. And, I mean, and, I mean, and quite frankly, I think there's a chance we're the third. I mean, that's the, <laughs> there's a, legitimately, there's a major drop off and there's a lot of people just not making profit and doing things wrong. So, I mean, there's lots of entities out there, but how many are making money? That, well, that's it. We know that nobody, uh, nobody is able to lose the money that Tony Khan is losing with AEW. So AEW is losing more money than any wrestling promotion currently existent in the world. And Ring of Honor can't be making a profit. Uh, Impact, we don't know. Is it fifty dollars either way of of dead zero whatever it's if it is either way it's not any appreciable amount of money um wwe is making tens and hundreds of millions what other i mean new japan i guess would probably be the second biggest gross of any promotion or third biggest gross behind aew aew probably has a good gross gross it's that net that's tricky but yeah, the net they get stuck in. <laughs> yes. um, but so New Japan would be the only one in the conversation for being either the... Well, to be honest, I don't know too much about the financials of CMLL, but they own their own buildings. I don't know if they pay well, yeah, everyone yeah. great. I mean, as a company, they may be making a fortune. But nevertheless, you, you, you can't... I, I, should court they, buy a, they making, should court buy a building? They, well, at CMLL, would they be making $12 million a year when it's converted from Mexican currency? I couldn't, I wouldn't think so, but I actually couldn't say one way or another. I don't know enough about their financials. Here's something else. I wonder if, if you know, did all that money that MLW has spent so far, did that come out of Quartz's pocket or did he borrow some? He might have to pay somebody back. Are you saying the money that Quartz spent so far just operating MLW? Well, yeah, at some point, you know, Somebody might need to get paid back so that part of the 20 million might need to go there. Oh, you mean like an investor? You th you're saying Court may have an investor. I don't know that he was trying to Gordon Scazzari this whole thing and pay for it out of his lottery winnings. Well, yeah. I mean, if MLW has investors, you got to think they're going to get a chunk of change from this. I mean, Court should get a nice vacation or two, certainly. <laughs> what about a house in Calabasas? You know what? Those are uh, easy to get. You could uh, certainly set up an LLC in another state. We could talk to him more about that. We'll be talking more about that in the future here on the show. Well, Jim, before we get out of here, let's hit on a few more topics that are happening and people are talking about right now. A little bit of a controversy stirring up or has stirred up on social media because of Maxine Dupree. I guess she worked a show. I don't know if this is a TV taping or... A house show. There's a lot of people there, so I would assume a TV taping, but who knows? But Dark a, match, maybe. There's a video of her walking to the back, down the entranceway, referee next to her. She appears to be a little upset, and I'll play this audio. It's 11 seconds. It's caused a lot of people to say a lot of things. Let's hear it. Stop! 
That's really the line right there. You suck. Don't come back while everyone else is booing. She is presented as a baby face. You have to think the booing may not necessarily be because of, uh, you know, her being a heel all of a sudden. And they played her music. So I'm assuming that there may not be a heel celebrating or something behind her. Well, no, it's some wise ass smart fan going, you suck because she sucks. Don't come back because he's a prick. Well, as I said, this has caused a lot of people to say a lot of things. A lot of the women's wrestlers have come out in support of Maxine Dupree. I have a few comments I'll read to you before getting your thoughts. Casey Katnazaro, who is a Katana he, Chance. What now? <laughs> Katana <laughs> Chance, under her real name, Casey Katnazaro. Katnazaro. I love Maxine Dupree. Her positive attitude is contagious. She's always excited to work, and I love being around her. Zelina Vega wrote, this is absolutely horrible. She doesn't deserve that. She's such a kind soul and works really hard. I would love if the bad parts of the biz don't harden her heart. They probably just mad because they can't drink your bath water, Maxine. Oh boy. Rhea Ripley added, I really wish that some of you got booed and ridiculed in the public eye while being new at your job. Learning and getting better is all a part of being human. Be better as humans. Becky Lynch, oh, on Christ. Twitter under her real name, tweeted out, if I hadn't sworn off tag team partners for life, Maxine Dupree would be my number one choice. Oh, good God. Uh, she then retweeted and wrote, meant it then, still mean it now. And... It other... I, I, I'm, I'm told she volunteers at homeless shelters and she contributes to the Humane Society. We're not saying that this girl is a horrible person or that, that she is not worthy of anybody's respect, but she's a goddamn public performer. If she was a singer and couldn't hit the note, a lot of people, boo, go for that. It's not her fault. She's trying, obviously, but she ain't cut out for this. And it's more the company's fault for putting her on national television when she's... I, I don't know what I'd be able to do with her in OVW television. That doesn't mean that she's not worthy of life and that she has no redeeming qualities. She's not a good wrestler. But having said that, when I first got into business, and it was pretty much common knowledge at that point, whether it's in the locker room you're being ribbed or the fan or whatever, don't put shit over because then they'll do it more. If, you, if, you're, if, you, if it's obviously affecting you, then the assholes will continue doing it. it but did, did you see people from the locker room writing open letters when they were chanting, die, Rocky, die, because he sucked? It, it, it. No, you don't put it over because then you tell all the asshole fans, hey, now we know Maxine Dupree's crying her eyes out in the fucking hotel room. Let's fuck with her. So no, you don't no, you don't need to do that either. And besides, God damn. Again, yes, the it hits differently with poor Maxine because everybody gets yelled at if you're a heel or just whatever you suck at some point or another. But she's really not real good. So it probably, she realizes that, but at the same point, I'm sorry. I don't work up a lot of sympathy for fans yelling, you suck at somebody when <laughs> at least it's not a physical assault with fists or a knife. You're not getting beer thrown in your eyes so that you could be sucker punched while you're blind. You're not having vomit thrown on you or expunged on you as I have had in the past. You're not being pelted with batteries and flashlights and jars of Vaseline. You're anything that comes out of a fucking purse or somebody's got in their pocket. Your car's not being vandalized. You're not being chased out of town on the interstate. People are yelling you suck. If you want to be a public figure, that cannot bother you. So everybody, everybody except this young girl is at fault, and the only fault she has is she's not good at what she's trying to do right now. But the company shouldn't be putting her in this position to go out there and show everybody that. And the other, I appreciate they're trying to stick up for their compadre in the locker room, but that's, it, 
just calling more attention to, hey, let's pile on this fucking lousy girl wrestler. Well, a couple of things. And again, it's unfortunate. We're talking about someone who we've seen on TV and we've seen in the house show footage with the bonsai drop. There are basics that are lacking. Yes. You know, th this is someone who doesn't appear ready for prime time as a wrestler, as a valet or a manager, whatever she was doing. That's one thing. They decided to push her in the ring in front of people. People react in different ways. I think part of the reason this took off was the framing of it, too. 8.7 million people have seen this so far on Twitter. The person who posted it, Danny, D-A-N-I, I assume it's a woman, this poor girl is getting booed at a house show for trying to get better. Wrestling fans suck. So it is a house show. But then here are some of the comments, the way people reacted to it. The way she looked upset as she walked to the back, I'm sick. Sickening. I mean, so people are reacting, <laughs> just sick, so fucking sick. Oh my God. If a baseball player from a ball gets put in the major leagues and they're not ready and they strike out every time and the fans of the home team boo, are they wrong? It's just, it's a bizarre, it's become, uh, you know, it's become everything we joke about in a lot of ways, especially the women's division. You know, when they had to pull those six motherfuckers off me in Tulsa that night and I was bleeding out of both sides of my fucking nose, it hurt my feelings. It really did. We don't even know if it hurt her feelings as much as everyone else, because all of a sudden everyone else jumped on it. How dare you boo the wrestler? Like, that's the other thing, because what is the other option? And I don't know if I would have reacted like that. I'm just defending the idea you could boo and say you suck to someone who's not very good at what they do. The other option is don't say anything. Just watch the bad stuff and... and you, may, you don't have to enjoy it, but don't tell everyone you don't. Go get popcorn. Just go get pop. Don't, don't even be there. See, when everybody gets else gets in trouble, you guys, I wasn't even there. I was getting popcorn. See, the problem is no one's saying what the reality is, which is we love working with you. You're a great person. You're even good on camera. You shouldn't be in the ring. Not everyone is a wrestler. Not everyone takes to it. Not everyone picks up on what to do. Not everyone physically looks imposing enough. It's not this whole fucking... Everyone gets a seat at the table. Let's give everyone a shot to do this. And yeah, just... and this is this is not gender inclusive either. It's gender. Ex it includes all the genders. We're not just picking on the girl wrestlers. There's, I've seen a lot of I've seen a lot of guys that shouldn't be wrestlers. And it, that's but again, if you want to do anything in the public eye, whether you suck or not, people are going to scream at you. You suck. I hate you. Even if you. If you do something even remotely more popular or successful than the person, the singer or the band or the actor or the wrestler or whoever that they like better, they'll still be mad at you. It, you cannot, you know, that's why I've said before, some people, especially I've never seen more sensitive wrestlers, male and female these days, some people should not be in the public eye. If you take... That seriously, other people's criticism of you, whether it's warranted or not, that it fucks with you and hampers your life, probably picked the wrong career choice because that's going to fucking happen. Well, we will see how Maxine Dupree develops as a wrestler, but if someone's not good at something, you need to be able to say it. Well, and and I can I can see you know some drunk wise ass in fucking you know uh, Madison Wisconsin or wherever they were at say hey, fuck you you say well fuck you come over here and say it to me I'll fucking snatch you by the neck <laughs> that's uh, and more irritating uh, than anything else but it, it, you know ah no it, 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 you should be able to express your opinion on whether somebody's any good or not at anything. I'm not uh, suggesting that everybody become a drunk prick and just yell at this poor girl. It probably already knew she would fucked up if it was that bad that the fans are like, fuck you, don't get, come back. It's a popularity but, contest. That's the problem. Everyone's reacting the way they are because they like her as a person. And they feel they have to jump to her defense. But wrestling isn't a popularity contest. I mean, gee, the, the overreaction to people from a few fans, from the fans booing, and I'd love to see the rest of the match to see what they're booing at. 
Well, man, maybe the heel was in the ring and, and, you know, inciting the crowd, and we're seeing this girl walk out where people are more one-on-one. -on -one. But, yeah, you suck too, Maxine. We'd, but, uh, again, the point is, <laughs> you know, if, especially in some cities with some smart crowds, is somebody that is, their work is the shits, whether they're green or inexperienced or just blah, they're going to boo them and catcall them and fucking yell at them, and they're going to have signs or whatever because that's what they do. And you can't, you know, you can't let that shit bother you. Fortunately, back in my day, we were too busy worrying about the felonious assaults and the prosecutable offenses that were being committed against us every night when we left the ring to worry about people saying we sucked. Well, Jim, another topic of conversation the last few days is a story that has come out about CMLL and work visas or Mexican wrestlers coming up and work visas, but specifically CMLL stars. I have an article here from Fightful, and it talks about Mike Johnson, the wrestling reporter, broke a story this past week that the United States government is in the process of canceling U.S. work visas for nearly 20 CMLL stars in Mexico. If that happens, obviously the process to get new visas could take months. This includes Volador Jr., Hechichero, Mascara Dorada, who have all appeared on AEW TV, Blue Panther, Dulce, Gadar G Dulce Gardenia. It's, it's Dolce Gabbana. Dolce, <laughs> Dolce Gardenia, El Sagrado, El Suicida. I don't know if you can use that name on US TV. Electrico, Espi Espiritu Negro, <laughs> Euphoria. <laughs> Fugaz. I, th I think that's what you're experiencing right now is a euphoric state. Gemello Diablo 1 and 2. Magico. Both, both of them? God damn it. Robin. Sangre Imperial. Soberano. He's the sober wrestler. Soberano. Templario. And even the referee Sagaz. They're all expected to be impacted. Well, now, now, what I was about to say, what, the people are saying, why is the United States government mad at these people? You, you can elaborate now. Well, Mike Johnson cited a source who said that after the company Full Blown Pro Wrestling, uh, which I'm not familiar with, a company in Texas. Laredo, I heard. They sponsored the work visas, and they had issues with management and CMLL over the process, and... Then the United States Department of Homeland Security contacted full-blown pro wrestling promoter Jerry Cadena, or Car uh, Cadena, whatever his name is, Jerry, good old Jerry. Good, good old Jerry. About the visas, and good old Jerry was told that he could be accused of fraud if the visas were flagged. Good old Jerry was said to have reached out to CMLO about the problem, and CMLO said they'll handle it. <laughs> through the U.S. Embassy in Mexico, <laughs> though the Department of Homeland Security issues work visas in the United States. Also, a source noted, there was a family member on the CMLL side who works for the embassy, so maybe that was how they could handle the situation. <laughs> CMLL is no longer communicating with good old Jerry, and the story is that he told the U.S. government that he did not intend to work with CMLL anymore, so any of the agreements he signed to work with their talent were terminated as of February 28th. So this is an interesting situation here. This means that a lot of this CMLL talent that we're going to work various shows in the country, specifically around the time of WrestleMania, or for Trip, or uh, not for Trip Labor, for AEW, this begins the process anew. And it's a long process, it could be. What do you think of this story and... Yeah. Obviously, this isn't the first time that, well, without accusing anyone here of anything, in the past, there have certainly been examples of wrestling promoters or wrestlers from other countries coming into the United States for a nice vacation and just happening to work a bunch of dates. Well, it, it, here's the thing. I can shed some light on the procedure. I don't know the intricacies of this big money deal between good old Jerry and CMLL's brother-in-law at the embassy. but. It, it, 
the the when you're trying to get a wrestler from outside the United States the paperwork the proper work visa to to wrestle on shows legally in the United States uh, while they're not a citizen a promotion has to they say sponsor but basically they can't uh, I'm I'm uh, Pedro Martinez from Mexico and I want to go to work in the United States. I can't just apply for papers and say, then I can go to the U.S. and find a job. You have to have a company in the United States that is already trying to offer you a job, wants to bring you in, and has to prove, at least through paperwork and fucking all that shit, that you are a specialized individual with special talents that we cannot easily fill this spot from the available American candidates. We're like, it's supposed to be if you're like a goddamn math genius and you need to be brought in from Germany by some university, right? But basically you can also prove that wrestlers have a specialized talent that everybody doesn't have. And that's why you're having to, we had to do that for Lance Storm and Chris Jericho in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Well, Lance Storm, because Jericho had dual citizenship because his, one parent was American, one Canadian. But with Lance, I had to have J.J. Dillon write a letter and had a few other people write letters Meltzer. saying, yes, Meltzer wrote one saying, yes, he is, uh, Lance Storm is a very special talent and has attributes that most people don't have and blah, blah, blah. And so then if a company is saying that we want to give this guy a job if his paperwork is approved, then that's one of the main things that they take into account. And that's why, you know, for WCW and WWF and uh, later WWE, that was kind of easy because, you know, you were signing, A, you had a budget to work with because this costs several thousand dollars a person. And B, you know, you're going to give him a full-time job. Hey, Jim, let me just jump in real quick. We're having a little bit of, uh, we're having some technical issues with the audio. I don't want to stop you from what you're doing right now, but I just want to say uh, to the listeners, we're sorry. We know there's yeah. something going on. We're working on it right now. Yeah, you're working on it. I don't know what to fucking do because I can't hear it and I don't know how this works anyway. But nevertheless, speaking of how things work, so if you're the big company, you got the budget, you can hire the uh, immigration attorneys, you pay several thousand dollars, wait for the paperwork, blah, 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 give the guy a contract. But if you're trying to, I'll give you an example. One of the reasons why Kevin Steen and El Generico were not fans of mine is because they were Canadian citizens, and Kerry Silken, running Ring of Honor, to bring them in, he was not only paying them their fee to be wrestlers but he and uh, flying them in from Montreal, but he paid for their paperwork. He sponsored them and said, oh, we're going to give them a contract, and, we're gonna, and that way they could work in the United States, and he paid the lawyer and paid the immigration deal. But what the indie guys were doing was if they could get one company to do that, then they could come in and work for anybody. If they were going to work for Joe down at the fucking Doubletree on Main Street, they'd say, oh, yeah, we're going to work for Ring of Honor. Here's our paperwork, right? These people at the airport don't know. So that's where I told him, I said, wait a minute, because we were sitting down to discuss their deal as all these things were starting to happen. I said, you mean to tell me he's not only paying you, he's not only flying you from Montreal, but he's paying for your paperwork? I said, how the fuck did you get that deal? And they looked at me like, how dare you say that? I said, I wouldn't be doing that because think about this. Let's say, but and, and Elgin and O'Reilly, Kyle, El, Kyle O'Reilly and Michael Elgin, in 2011 and 12, we were trying to do the Sinclair deal. They didn't have paperwork. They they had not, Carrie couldn't afford it, and they had not even made the steps. I didn't even know until we were putting the whole deal together that they didn't have paperwork. That's why O'Reilly just came over from Vancouver and stayed with Davey Richards. If he went back home, he might not be able to get back across. And everybody was screaming at us to, oh, they ought to put the belt on Michael Elgin. As it turned out, apparently Elgin's a fucking lunatic. I don't know what he's been doing lately. But 10 years ago, everybody wanted to be the world champion. How can we put the fucking world title on a guy that might be turned away for five years next time they catch him at an airport? So I ended up spending $1,000 on getting the thing started for Elgin because he was an important part of the card at that point when I couldn't get 
Sinclair to do anything because they didn't want to fucking start that procedure while they were just buying the company. So they would, eh, guys will, it, the, the airlines and the people at the customs, they've smartened up to wrestlers because they see boots in a bag or mask in a bag or whatever. So guys would even go to the effort of shipping gear over to somebody in the States that they knew, a promoter they were going to work for a lot or a friend that they knew could meet him and they were going to drive him around. And that way they come in with no gear in their bag and they just say, I'm going to visit the Washington Monument. And nobody knows what the Mexican guys look like because they all wear masks. So if they're not wearing a mask, you don't know what goddamn Blue Panther's real name is, even if you're the most dedicated wrestling fan. So they have a better time, easier time than... Then and the Japanese don't have too bad of a time because most people don't know who they are. But the goddamn Canadians, and especially when they would get on television or be advertised it by their own name, they would get popped quite a bit. Anyway, going back to Steen and Generico. I will say though, for the Japanese wrestlers, at least with them, you do see a lot of the tourism photos of them like in big cities checking out different sites and stuff. Well, yeah, because <laughs> because New Japan won't let its guys come over anymore without proper paperwork. See, as some of the outlaw guys in Japan, they do the same thing the outlaw guys here do. With Steen and Generico, that's the point I was going to make for this particular CMLL story with this Jerry and the promotion in Laredo. Even though, as I said, Kerry Silken financed their paperwork, Steen and Generico could work for anybody. And that's why, because I said, and do this math. Okay, let's say they're getting paid 500 bucks a night and Ring of Honor's running 24 shows a year, right? That's $12,000 a piece for each of them. But they're also getting a plane ticket a month. What's a plane ticket? $400, let's say. Okay, now they're, they're each one of them is, is costing $500 per night for a two-night weekend plus $200 per night for a goddamn plane ticket. There's 700. Now if you if you spread 4 or 5000 dollars over those 24 dates, all of a sudden you're paying these guys almost $1000 a night to be on a show whereas the Briscoe brothers who were to me infinitely more valuable to Ring of Honor than Steen and Generico and I think everybody will will agree equally as valuable. They live in Delaware, no paperwork. They can drive to most of the Ring of Honor shows, and they're getting paid almost the same thing. They were all within 100 bucks of each other either way. So how can you justify spending twice as much money on these fucking guys that are pains in the ass than these other guys that are fucking gold, right? So Did Kerry Silken back you up? Because obviously he's the one um, who made those deals with them. He still has relationships with he, them. He he wasn't he wasn't even he wasn't even sitting there at that time. It was me and Hunter Johnston talking. No, it was me and Adam Pierce. I think it's the first time talking to him. It may still have been Pierce booking, but but nevertheless, that's what the the indie guys who get fascinations with other talent, especially if they're close to them and they're friends, they will go. Oh, you got to have this guy. Oh, he's great. Oh, he's super. And that's how they would all work their way in and work for everybody, all the promoters. And they'd get whatever. But the point is, they probably did the same thing with CMLL. They said, you know, not only AEW, but we could work for this guy and that guy and the other guy, but we need a company, a promotion in the United States to sponsor our guys. Because do you think that full-blown pro wrestling in Laredo is going to book and pay 20 of these guys on a regular basis? Or is that a company that runs and uses one or two of them and they've gotten to know the guy and what they did was they said, hey, you tell the goddamn government that you're going to sponsor all these guys and we'll take care of it because Aunt Gladys works in the embassy. So one of these fucking indie outlaw bullshit deals. And then somebody found out something and they called this guy and said, are you going to goddamn give a contract to and pay a salary to and employ all of these people that your name is on? Humming, 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 humming. Well, they said, that he said, well, we'll goddamn pop you for fraud, motherfucker. We asked them, who told them this? They said, Jerry, good old Jerry. Yeah, Jerry. Jerry said, and you know, <laughs> it's so, so that's what one of these, it, it's got to be something along that nature. Is this guy found out that he might get in, 
trouble because somebody found out something that they didn't think somebody was going to find out. And now instead of being on the hook for, you know, putting his name on paperwork with the government that he's going to tend to all these goddamn foreign citizens coming in to work for him, he's saying, oh, no, this deal's gone south. I'm not going to work for him anymore. You deal with them. I'm out of it. It's got to, it's, it's obvious. They were trying to fucking, somebody was going to do the easy half-ass way, save some money, use somebody as a fucking, you know, point guy, and it fell apart. What do you say to the wrestling fan of Weez and Conspiracies? I don't know what you'd say here. What do you well, say? Well, there is the, no conspiracy. No, no, well, what, do you, what do you say to the wrestling fan that says with AEW's plans to do more with CMLL, including potentially with the Forbidden Door pay-per-view at Arthur Ashe Stadium this year, that WWE called some contacts <laughs> in Washington and made sure these luchadors couldn't come into the country? Oh, good God. There I, are some fans saying that. What do you say? What the fuck? Nobody in the WWE even knows who Checachero is. Hechachero. What the fuck? I don't care. No. They didn't even have to sabotage it because they sabotaged their own self, trying to save money and do bullshit under the table for cheap and with fucking stooges. That's what this goddamn deal is. That's the way that most of the immigration paperwork and wrestling has been done for 40 fucking years, either halfway on the cheap or not at all. And they wanted to be able to get their guys into where they even they're not going to be working full time 20 guys are not going to start working full time for AEW but they CMLL was seeing hey if we get them where they've got papers they can go to the United States we can book them for anybody right who's going to know well it didn't get that far cuz they didn't do the shit right triple a will know <laughs> that's who will and, and maybe you know what who would rather sabotage CMLL working with fucking Tony Khan, the WWE or AAA? How did how did the goddamn United States government find out about this when we don't even know who these fucking people are? It is interesting, and I'm not saying there's anything to it, but in terms of timing, the last time we just recently talked on the show about these guys, other than match reviews, was the idea that them being on the shows, yeah. the CMLL wrestlers, meant that AAA wrestlers and any other luchadors cannot be on those shows. And Soon thereafter, somebody tells the U.S. government that CMLL's trying to pull something. They're working and with who, Jerry. <laughs> they're working with Jerry. And who gets more bookings? The AAA guys that can't be on the show if the CMLL guys are there. But that's it's just, it's bullshit. And it's small-time nickel and dime. Pay. That's... Uh, that's the way Mexico operates, the Mexican wrestling promotions. We've told the stories many times. When, when Pina was coming to Stamford to meet with Vince McMahon, to Greenwich, to meet him at his house. And he was supposed to be there Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. He showed up promptly at 9 a.m. on fucking Thursday. <laughs> I don't remember that story. What was said? Yes. we it's, it's, Oh, senor, he came in bearing us all gifts. I've still got mine. It's a little tiny Aztec fucking ashtray that he picked up at the airport on his way on the plane. He brought $7.95 <laughs> fucking airport gift shop stuff for everybody. Thank you for inviting me into your home. Oh, I didn't and expect because, you to be here. Let me get something else out of my pocket. Yes, yes, out of my beer. Have a comb. Um... <laughs> It, but but it was we all went. Me, Bruce, Jim Ross, and went. And maybe Shitstain was at that time when they were going to work and have Super Astros and work with the you know the Mexican guys. And Pena was going to come and meet, and we're all sitting there on Wednesday, and they get a phone call from the office. Best Zaza say, "Well, Pena says he's going to be there tomorrow." What? I don't know if we ever got an explanation. But they, uh, 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 many of the guys that had worked Mexico said that's not unusual. It's Mexican time. You know, they start the shows whenever they want. Who knows who's booked? You show up and maybe you can work. It's just goddamn, there's no detail work going on down there. It's haphazard and it starts at the top. So they, they were trying to do something under the table, save some money, not involve immigration lawyers. 20 guys papers to work from mexico to the united states if maybe the rates have gone down does anything go down years ago it had been about 80 grand 
if you could move everybody through and they did, passed all the background checks and et cetera, that would work. Jerry's doing good. That's what I'm saying. Maybe Jerry found out he might have to pay for it too. As soon as he heard we're the government, he's like, oh shit, fuck. What did they do? See, you don't, you don't pay the government. You pay the attorneys to work out all the shit with the government. That's so right. if they were trying to bypass that, the actual visa may is at a few hundred dollars. I don't know. That was I was always looking at the bottom line. But they tried to probably go under the table and not use attorneys or file proper paperwork and thinking that the aunt at the embassy and good old Jerry and Laredo could work this out. Well, we questioned earlier just how many millions of dollars CMLL was making. Maybe here's another way they keep some of their money. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's not what you make, it's what you save. I'm going to call and take this kid. No, no, we we will take care of this. We will talk yes. to someone here. Don't worry. Yes. Well, you don't have to worry either because we have more topics to talk about, but technical difficulties that we've been going a while and several people died. So we <laughs> will return before you know it, almost like it's tomorrow on the Jim Cornette Experience. Yeah. With more of this, we got to talk about uh, more stuff happening just everywhere in wrestling. And of course, the big pay-per-view coming up and a big dynamite that you got to talk about. And oh, boy. Hey, we we don't have to be at least timely with the dynamite because it'll still stink as bad in a few days as it did yesterday. Yeah, if anyone ever wants to talk about how hot AEW is or isn't, there was a time where people lost their minds if we didn't get up an AEW review quickly. Now people kind of don't give a shit. Well, you know, the thing is, there's nothing... There's nothing to talk about. The, there's the, nothing well, except yes, the drama. There is. The program is not worth talking about in any length or substance, but there are so many things wrong with everything that to point it out takes forever. That's the problem. If you watch AEW and you, you know, have any sort of standards, you just come away with it with things to point out that what is happening here? Even when there's good stuff that goes down that's surrounded by nonsense... And there'll be more of that nonsense on the Jim Cornette Experience, wherever you find your favorite podcast. We're wrapping things up quick. Don't forget, the drive through is brought to you by the law office of Stephen P. New, 888-69, nope, 877, ah. I still remember that number, 877-507-8383, or as they say in Kentucky, 50-Steve. That's right. Also, newlawoffice.com. Get even with Stephen and say hello and let him know you heard about it here on the Experience. Uh, the experience wherever you find your favorite podcast, patreon.com slash cornet. The archive going back to 2013, $5 a month, patreon.com slash cornet. The official YouTube channel, go to YouTube and just look for Jim Cornette. Hey, there it is. We're on Twitter and everywhere else. And you'll hear more of us tomorrow or wherever. There's more coming. But until then, for Jim Cornette, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally ho. You dirty kumquat.